had a really a very interesting and inspiring day. We talked about the trustworthy internet. We talked about uh, the uh, core uh, software ecosystem that we are building uh, in the context of uh, onto chain. And we also discussed um, several um, topics that are open uh, for potential applicants from all around um, the European Union and all countries that are associated to the um, Horizon uh, Europe um, Research and Innovation Program. And for today, we want to have um, a little bit different day so that the potential applicants can see how our uh, 30 projects have been progressing so far, uh, what have been uh, the software solutions they have uh, delivered so far. You will be able to see very inspiring uh, demonstrations and um, you're all invited to consider how these technologies could be employed in the applications, in the designs of your projects uh, that you're going to submit in the third open call. So um, I leave now the floor to Clevis, uh, who is going to uh, guide you through uh, the first uh, morning session about these uh, success stories. Hello, welcome again to the on the Chain Summit, second day. Uh, today is the first session. And uh, as you know, from yesterday, we have uh, explained some of the on the Chain project briefly, but not uh, in details. And today with us, we have some of the projects that you can know better, you can ask questions to them, and uh, you can know what is their contribution to the on the Chain community. Uh, so I have also to remind you, the, the people from audience, they can uh, uh, join to the Slido with the Onto Chain uh, uh, Slido channel and they can write the password Onto Chain 2022 to ask questions. So our first speaker will be a project from OpenCall2 that is founded on the OntoChain project and is called DKG. And the speaker will be Branimir Rakic, who, who is founder and chief technical officer at Trace Labs. He is going to talk about Web3 asset graphs with origin trail decentralized knowledge graph. So welcome Branimir and thank you for being here. Uh, all right. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Guten Morgen. Unzo. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have a little bit of a different title on the presentation that was announced, but it's the same presentation. And I actually wanted to spice it up but ex by going a little bit further into what um, actually the Google of Web3 would look like and um, how this all relates to uh, onto chain um, and uh, blockchain and generally origin trail. So. Um, as Clevis has announced, I'm Branimir, I'm one of the three founders of uh, Origin Trail, actually Trace Labs, the company that's building Origin Trail. And I'll explain very briefly uh, in about 10 slides what we do and uh, why we do it. So starting with why, I want to briefly introduce this notion back of Web2. I'm sure everybody here kind of knows what Web3 is, but uh, I want to present a little bit of a different angle to this. So uh, we believe that Web2 Web was great uh, for obviously for the world, but like it was also great for a few companies that were actually extracting a lot of value from data. And it was really about data extraction. All of us obviously using social networks, uh, as we talked yesterday, uh, we're the users, but we're also the product, right? With, with all our data, same goes for pretty much any website in Web2. And the three main building blocks that basically uh, Web2 is has leveraged uh, and web in general is obviously URLs being the key identifier for pretty much anything. Um, then obviously we have algorithms. One of the most typical one is web search. You've seen this search bar pretty much on every website you use, right? And then finally, having this capability to read and write. So web one was about reading, web two is like you could actually go and post something, right? But the problem with web two is that um, these URLs, these identifiers, you can really only rent for a few years, right? And if that expires, it's no longer yours. Um, 
algorithms are proprietary. You don't even know, see them. Some of the stuff is open source. You can see somewhere, but like you don't really know what's running on servers. And um, it's questionable uh, in, in terms of uh, the verifiability of data. So whenever you read or write something, is it really coming from that source? Is it hasn't been modified? Has it been uh, maybe tampered with in some way or maybe even hidden from you by somebody, again, running a proprietary algorithm? So uh, it's, it's pretty much about the control. It's about, about the control of identifiers, algorithms, and the data. And ideally, what we want to see in Web3, we want to see a paradigm shift from data to assets. So we no longer start talking about data. We actually think of these things as something we own. Um, so therefore, we would own identifiers. Think of some a uh, magical identifier like this, which looks a lot like a Web3 URL. Imagine that, or imagine a more of, instead of search, something called asset discovery. You're able to find assets online, be that any single asset. It could be a physical thing, like a bottle of wine, or a car, or a painting, or maybe a digital one, like an NFT. We're here at the NFT Museum. So think of them all as, as basically the same, uh, as, as the same concept, assets in Web3. Uh, and then the algorithms, ideally, would be uh, for asset discovery and would not be proprietary. And then finally, uh, the concept of all of this actually now shifting to actually you being able not to just read, write, but also to own, again, owning assets. Um, so in the true spirit of Web3, you would own the identifiers, you would own and control the algorithms, and you would manage and trade or market really your, your assets. And that's what I will be speaking a little bit more today on and what we're doing with, uh, with OntoChain. But briefly, I want to introduce Origin Trail. Um, so Origin Trail is actually a project that we started quite a while ago, and our mission is to organize humanity's assets, making them discoverable, verifiable, and valuable. And I'll explain all of these three key terms um, in, in the, the coming uh, slides, but basically, how do we do this? So what does Origin Trail do? And then I'll explain how that relates to OntoChain. Basically, Origin, Origin Trail uses two technologies for this. Technology number one, can you guess which one it is? Anybody? Blockchain. <laughs> so, uh, and I want to introduce this very quickly. I know everybody knows about blockchain here, but uh, the key thing I want to s uh, point out is that blockchains are trust networks. So they're not um, particularly great databases, as you, as you can see on this slide. So they're great for you know sharing a common ledger, which it has some tamper-proof uh, capabilities, great for tokenization, for decentralized identity, DeFi, all kinds of cool things, um, and generally trusted computation between multiple parties, uh, but they are basically stateful trusted protocols. And uh, however, they're not great for databases. If you ever wanted to run a SQL query on a blockchain, you will be pleasantly surprised that it's not possible, and it's not because it's not been designed for that. So actually, in my personal opinion, uh, as somebody who's been uh, working with supply chain solutions for quite a while, Blockchains are not a great fit for supply chains. That rhymes, blockchain, supply chain, but it's not a great fit, trust me. However, blockchain is a great component into solutions that uh, uh, can be built for supply chains and are being built, and I'll explain how. So, like I said, blockchain, so component number one. Component number two, knowledge graphs. They are actually entity networks or semantic networks. I guess everybody here is uh, familiar with at least the notion of the knowledge graph, but I'll briefly reintroduce it. So the idea is that they connect entities via relationships. And essentially, when Google coined this term knowledge graph, they explained it in a very nice way. Uh, it's called, they said, it's things, not strings. So we're not speaking like of arrays of characters anymore. We're speaking of an actual thing. It has a type, a very strong type, has some extensibility, has it's been, been built so that any machine should be able to understand that this is a thing. Kind of like um, if, you, if you're a software developer, moving from procedural to object-oriented, that sort of paradigm shift, but on the level of data management and databases. And essentially, it's being used by pretty much all of the big Web2 companies. So whenever, back to that extraction of data, whenever you type into some, something into Google, or whenever uh, Amazon recommends you something to buy, or Netflix recommends your show to watch, basically all that comes from their own knowledge graph. And uh, that's because they can ask the knowledge graph, hey, what does this person, what would they like to see? Um, what, what are they like? Are they similar to these other people that were watching these, I don't know, Stranger Things or whatever shows online? And then because of that semantics and all of this knowledge ingrained in this graph, by connecting all these entities, people, shows, uh, any content really, they're able to answer very complex questions. Blockchains are not. 
So we combine those two and we get something really powerful and we move actually from data to assets in the knowledge graph. So it's a very simple illustration of a knowledge graph. So we have a Mona Lisa, which is in Louvre and Louvre is a museum and you see it's kind of a network of these objects and, and some relationships between them, between them. And as I said, you can answer some uh, very, uh, very cool questions. So you can ask like, in which city is Mona Lisa? And because you can find that Louvre is in Paris, because it's all encoded in the graph. It's quite simple actually for a machine to answer such questions, but it's also great for asset discovery. So you wanna find Mona Lisa as the asset or a car or some, let's say piece of medicine, you're able to use the same, um, the same structure. It's great for extensibility. You wanna add something to this. For example, say that James comes from Berlin. You just add the city of Berlin and you point kind of an arrow from there. Well, a little bit more complex to do it, but essentially that's it. And then finally, obviously, there's a, a ton of great things you can do with it. Um, reasoning, machine learning, all of these great, um, this amazing space that you can leverage, but this is, um, this is another topic. I won't talk about it too much today. Um, <coughs> so, Origin Trail is actually the first decentralized knowledge graph, or as introduced, the DKG project. So as you can see, there's, there's these two layers. Layer two is the decentralized knowledge graph. Layer one is actually a multi-chain blockchain layer. So there's, um, uh, quite a few blockchains that it supports today. It's actually a network that's been running since 2018 in, in mainnet. And as I said, layer two, the decentralized knowledge graph is not a blockchain. It's a knowledge graph hosted on a decentralized network or of 2000 plus, not entirely sure exactly of the number right now, nodes ran by the origin trail community around the globe. Anybody can run a node. You guys can run a node. It's free. It's totally open source. And the network is completely permissionless and, uh, and it's participatory. It's actually designed for anybody to be able to, to use it. So um, that's a very, very sort of simplified overview. We have a, a, a deeper slide um, coming soon, but um, I guess what I wanted to communicate is that we have something that's blockchain and something that's a knowledge graph. All of it is decentralized, but it's two distinct layers. Um, and it basically looks a little bit more like this. So in this consensus layer, we have a bunch of blockchains uh, currently uh, origin trail Layer two is operating on Ethereum, Gnosis, and Polygon, but actually very soon coming to Polkadot. Literally in two days, we're launching the Origin Trail parachain, which is going to be one of the chains on Polkadot, but also we've also partnered with a bunch of projects from, from the Polkadot ecosystem, which is what Polkadot is great for. Uh, so you'll see, for example, the Akala blockchain as well in there. Um, on top of that, obviously, the blue uh, is, is the decentralized knowledge graph, which has its own network layer, its own data layer, and uh, a bunch of services which is where, um, where the actual on-chain services we're building come in from. On top of those, obviously, we build Web3 applications. Um, very briefly about the Origin Trail parachain that's launching very soon. So it's one of the chains on Polkadot, um, and it's launching June 4th. It's going to be a chain which has some quite great characteristics for, uh, for uh, um, running uh, with together with a decentralized knowledge graph. So not only in terms of being very tailored for the DKG, meaning uh, all of the, um, it's not going to be a general purpose uh, chain by, um, as we kind of generally know it, it's going to be graph tailored. So basically we're, we're going to be releasing something called graph contracts in the near future, which will be actually um, uh, aware of, of graphs in terms of uh, all of the standards that we know of, like RDF, Sparkle, and so on. But also it's, it's a highly scalable blockchain because it leverages this uh, property of Polkadot of shared security. <coughs> so if you haven't, um, maybe briefly about Polkadot, if you don't know about Polkadot, it's basically a multi-chain network designed for uh, chains to interoperate between each other and each chain ha can have it its own logic. So basically it, it achieves um, 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 shared security through one uh, called relay chain that actually has uh, validators that validate all the chains and your chain really is responsible just for block production and for its own state transition function. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, we believe Polkadot is going to be the next generation of blockchains in terms of both design, but also the history of the people who built it. Um, and the team is actually here from Berlin. It's called Parity. You've probably heard of them. They built the best Ethereum client. <coughs> so anyway, um, this is launching a few days. If you're interested, look it up. We have a website uh, dedicated to Origin Trail Parachain. And um, basically, what does then Origin Trail do back to that story of URLs? So. We actually went from this concept of URLs and introduced something called UALs, Univer Uniform Asset Locators, that basically are a URI extension that combines DIDs and uh, the Knowledge Graph identifiers. So 
something along the lines of this, but uh, a little bit more complicated. And actually, you can use this to um, set an identifier that you own for any asset in the world, be that an NFT or your car. Um, then you have user control search. Literally, the search algorithm runs on your machine. You can see it. It's open source. And you can search for all of these assets uh, through the DKG and, and Web3. And finally, obviously, all of this you can own. So all of these asset graphs that are stored in the DKG are something that of a state that you own, kind of like a permission state for you on, uh, on the graph that anybody can query. And then you can also transfer the ownership of that state. Uh, so basically, we have a Web3 asset URL, we have transparent open algorithms, and we have Web3 asset knowledge graphs. Um, so how does this fit into the on-to-chain story? Well, basically, uh, we have um, been working on for several months together with, uh, with the uh, on-to-chain ecosystem on building services on top of the origin trail decentralized knowledge graph. And we call this tool stack K-tools or knowledge tools. And basically, they're designed to... Um, enable market incentivization of the, the knowledge economy. Pur I purposely don't say data economy <laughs> because we move from this notion of, of data to assets and really knowledge. So essentially, we build four different services, again, open source and anybody can use. Um, and uh, when I say anybody, um, uh, we've been really glad that uh, the OntoChain team has uh, pronounced DKG as one of the core protocols that you can use in the on-to-chain stack. So essentially, uh, if you're applying for the open call, which I recommend because it's a really cool ecosystem, if you're listening to this, apply. Uh, you can also use, use this, what I'm talking about. So um, these four tools, the knowledge tokens, wallets, and mar marketplaces and tenders basically are, are built to facilitate this, this economy. If you have um, a knowledge asset, you can put it in, well, your knowledge wallet, right? And then uh, associate tokens which you can then um, uh, use to trade these knowledge assets with or provide access control, for example. Then where, do, where can you trade it? You can do it either on the knowledge marketplace. There are several algorithms that uh, are completely um, dis intermediating this, so there's no need for anybody in between you and uh, like whatever you're buying or whoever you're selling to. You can, uh, you can trade basically data for tokens, knowledge for tokens for without any intermediation. Um, and same goes for knowledge tenders. You can ask like, hey, I need this data and then people can subscribe and, and, uh, and provide uh, their, their knowledge as, as in any tender. Um, <coughs> and how does this look like in terms of the stack? Basically, we have blockchains at the bottom, obviously, DKG is a component in it. And then the, the basically all of that rest of the onto chain stack that you've seen yesterday fits w within the same layer. So you can use all of these technologies together because they've been designed to be interoperable. Uh, they're all based on, on the same standards. And essentially, the knowledge tools come in that service layer that I've shown previously. While the on-to-chain services, what we are building here as projects and the future projects to be, they fit together on top as well. So this is all synergistic. And the two, essentially, two ecosystems, on-to-chain and the origin trail ecosystems, are very uh, knit tightly, can be tightly knit together. So all of this is something you can use and uh, hopefully benefit from. <coughs> Pardon me. So one thing that, that I didn't mention is that uh, being completely decentralized, both of those layers that I talked about actually operate with their own uh, incentive tokens. Uh, they're called Trace and OTP, Origin Trail Parachain Token, which is launching as, as we launch the Origin Trail Parachain. And they are basically used to um, incentivize the whole, all of these activities that I've been mentioning. So obviously on top, um, when, you're build, when, when we provide all of these services with, it, with the on-to-chain stack and with the DKG tools, uh, we essentially enable something we like to call semantic Web3 applications um, as a synergy of what? Semantic Web and, and Web3, right? Very briefly about Origin Trail, actually it's being used quite a lot already. Um, it's, um, we're proud to say we're one of the, um, we built technology that's one of the rare Web3 technologies that is actively being used in production by many enterprises. Um, so we had a lot of hoops to run through. So one of them is the Swiss railway company. They track rail parts uh, using Origin Trail. Basically they're rail assets, um, as well as the British Standards Institution. So BS, uh, Swiss railway company has four applications built on Origin Trail. British Standards Institution has six. One of them is actually a pharmaceutical tracking solution we presented recently in Davos, which basically um, uh, basically gives uh, the ability for any um, company along uh, the pharmaceutical supply chain to track pharmaceutical products, be they in large boxes or boxes in boxes or whatever, because we leverage these 
GS1 standards. Um, you probably, if you've never heard of GS1, you've probably seen their barcodes on any physical product, right? Well, that's a GS1 standard. Um, apart from that, a bunch of uh, US retailers are using Origin Trail through a BSI solution. Uh, so retailers such as Walmart, Target, Home Depot, they exchange factory audit information through the decentralized knowledge graph. So it's, it's quite um, spread out already, and uh, that's where we actually have a lot of these learnings and how we've been building uh, the Origin Trail um, further into what is to come, the version six actually coming in a few, in a few months. <coughs> But what I've been speaking about is just really the tip of the iceberg. Because right now, Web3 assets are only just that little bit on top. And there's so many assets that we all need to bring to Web3, enable them, make them discoverable, verifiable, valuable, make them programmable, make them really uh, even potentially intelligent agents. So, but all of those are still below the line. We need to get them to Web3. And that is the mission, um, I believe, of everyone here um, and all of our projects. Um, so to conclude, what Origin Trail is really about, we're about network effects. And to do these network effects, we do three things. We leverage ecosystem partnerships. So we're partnered with, for example, uh, a lot of companies in the Polkadot ecosystem, in the Ethereum ecosystem, but as well as um, a, a bunch of companies in the supply chain space, enterprise world. Here, we're talking with a lot of projects from the on-chain ecosystem on collaborations. Um, and we believe this is the only way to actually build the proper Web3. We should not be uh, building more data silos, more um, and walled gardens. We actually need to build together uh, and synergistically. Um, also, the second order network effects, we try to build between assets and users, very much like Google has built their PageRank algorithm and won the search engine race, basically, by leveraging these connections between websites to give you the most relevant results. Uh, or Facebook using that on friends, on people. Basically, uh, all of those connections, the same algorithms, we kind of want to take from them and we want to bring to Web3 and make them uh, obviously open source and generate value based on these network effects. Um, finally, cross-system interoperability. So the idea there is to use stacks like OntoChain, Polkadot, all of the other technologies, EVM, basically, and integrate and enable anybody to build on top of these. So they're, they're open designed for and neutral design for interoperability. <coughs> and if you have never heard, uh, there's actually a law. It looks like this. Um, it is um, the law of network effects. It's called the Metcalf's law, uh, which says that uh, the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of participants in that network. Any network, telephone network, uh, social network, or a knowledge graph as a network, right? <coughs> so actually the guy who invented this law, his name is Robert Metcalf, and he's our advisor. And he actually said this. He said that uh, the early Metcalf's law talked about connections of machines and how valuable this can be. And um, Facebook was about connecting people. And then Origin Trail is actually working on connecting uh, the, the connectivity of data and value that can be derived from it. So our assumption is that, and our uh, not, not just assumption, but what we're working towards is that we want to leverage these network effects on the uh, level of Web3 assets and the data associated with them. So the more the assets, the, the higher the end and the higher the value. And that means we need to integrate systems together. Otherwise, we create another data silo situa situation and we're not in Web3, we're in Web2. Um, so I guess, I guess I'm a little over time. Um, thank you, everybody. This was uh, all I had to show you today. Um, and I don't know if we have any questions lined up or do we just go through presentations, but uh, I'm happy to take questions here or or outside, whatever. So thank you. So if we have any question for Branimir, we can. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Branimir, for, uh, for your presentation. Um, I just uh, have a question. So I mean, I'm very familiar with your work because we meet uh, weekly. Uh, but uh, just for the audience, because people may hear us from uh, remotely, um, and also here. So you mentioned some several kinds of integration between your uh, platform and uh, onto chain. Also, you mentioned some of the results that you have in your onto chain project. So uh, could you, in let's say three, four, four sentences, just as pu bullet points, say what kind of APIs or functionality do you offer to third parties? Sure. Uh, 
So um, I'll try to illustrate uh, the, the tool stack that I mentioned, knowledge tokens, knowledge wallets, knowledge marketplaces, knowledge tenders, basically all go together. So as a value proposition for somebody like, let's say a data science company or uh, a company that produces a lot of data through uh, sensors or really just has a lot of very highly organized knowledge, let's say of Web3, maybe, um, maybe you have a very organized uh, synced database with the blockchain, like for example, the graph, uh, basically, you can connect, uh, you can create um, knowledge assets out of this. And creating these knowledge assets, uh, you're able to use, you're able to uh, tokenize them. That means sell them, sell access to them, or sell the whole asset, uh, the ownership to the asset. Um, and for that, you can actually mint your own tokens. That means you can mint, uh, let's say, I can mint Brana tokens, and Brana tokens, there, there could be a hundred of them, and you could uh, buy them to access the data that I provide through the marketplace. I could also, as a company, I could ask like, hey, I need this data. I'm looking for whatever um, humidity data from farms in uh, Germany. Um, and anybody who has this data is able to post this to, to a tender uh, in return get tokens. Um, and then finally, obviously, all of this infrastructure is connected with, um, with the, the interoperable uh, tooling and standards such as decentralized identifiers, such as uh, um, RDF, Sparkle, pretty much all of the, the whole semantic stack so that you can you, you can integrate that easily with any within any application. You don't need to like sort of know how to parse something if you already understand schema.org, for example. So essentially, it leverages the technology to enable the exchange of knowledge as assets, which is currently not really possible. Um, and if you really want to do a s super simple um, analogy, think of Airbnb. Airbnb before Airbnb, you can only go to a hotel, right? Or you could maybe rent an apartment somewhere. While Airbnb gave you one platform where you can go and put your apartment for rent or go and like find an apartment in Berlin to stay in. Uh, and all of a sudden, a bunch of these things just became part of the market and they weren't, they, they weren't previously. So Airbnb was a catalyzer to bring assets that were not previously on the market to the market. We want to do the same for knowledge assets. So bringing all of them that haven't been on the market so far or if they have been, they've been exploited or value has been extracted from them by well, not you. <laughs> so we want this to enable uh, to be to, to enable to anybody to do and to actually create this um, incentivize this ability to to market um, all of the knowledge assets. I hope that answers the question. It wasn't three or four sentences. <laughs> I, I know. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Could you give a few specific practical examples of DKGK tools? How do you envision these services actually being used in the next few years? Um, good question. So, practical example would be, for example, you have um, you have a specific um, set of um, uh, a data stream, let's say, that is uh, very interesting for for uh, let's say um, services. Like um, an example would be, you're running a node, uh, let's say a blockchain node or um, uh, a node that um, indexes the blockchain somehow, and you're providing this to to other. Uh, services, right? <coughs> and because this, this is a valuable service, it needs to be synced constantly. You need some sort of way to monetize or really limit so that you don't get the tragedy of the commons that everybody sort of rushes to your RPC or whatever. We've seen that happen quite a lot actually in the blockchain space. So the idea here is that instead of this just being a data stream as in Web2, you actually create a, a data or a knowledge asset out of it. And the, with this asset, you're able to actually sell it. Th what does this also mean? Because it's an asset. It's indexed in the in the network, and therefore you're able to find it. So that that's where we get this discoverability property. You're able to say a query, uh, just like Netflix. What are the shows that this person would like to see? Well, you, you could search for what are is, is this data that I'm looking for, and you basically discover it like in Google, and then you can consume it. How can you consume it? Using knowledge tools. You can, if there is a knowledge token minted for that particular knowledge asset, you can purchase it and then cons use that as a consumable token. Or if there was a specific, let's say, NFT minted, which is another version of knowledge tokens, uh, you, it can be kind of a subscription NFT token. So relatively similar to something actually Tanasis was talking about yesterday. Um, and then obviously, um, as I mentioned, uh, you can uh, leverage knowledge marketplaces, just like, for example, NFT marketplaces today, to trustlessly trade uh, these knowledge assets between, between um, people. So in the next uh, couple of years, we see that um, all of these tools basically get integrated into applications across the web tree. So if you want to build a decentralized search, 
and you want to use, um, um, you want to build an app that uses search, you want to search for any asset in Web3, any NFT, uh, you can just take this code that we built and it will work it for you. Um, and you, you just literally inject it in your website. So you get this coverability as a service in a way. Uh, or for example, if you want to create uh, out of, uh, um, let's say, um, your social media profile, you want to have the ability that somebody, I don't know, posts messages to a specific area of that profile, um, you could actually uh, make that um, as an asset and you can enable the people to get, uh, not just subscribe to it, but also to be able to write uh, to, to that state if they purchased some knowledge token. So these are, these are just some examples that are going to be coming um, in the next, uh, well, not even a few years, I suppose this year, but um, in the coming years, basically expect these tools to pop up in your, I don't know, um, search bar on OpenSea or some places like that. Um, does Origin 12 facilitate data privacy through features like compute to data, sending computation to data, so it doesn't leave the owner's spread? That's a very good uh, question. I haven't uh, touched upon that much, but essentially important part of the decentralized knowledge graph is that it's not all public. So it's, it is a network of nodes which actually communicate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So there's leap P2Ps underneath, um, but not all of the nodes hold all of the state. And that is a, an improvement and obviously uh, something that's not needed as in blockchain because it's not a consensus based network, that layer two that I talked about. So all of these nodes host parts of the, of the public graph. Think of it as like a distributed database. Not every node in a distributed database should be responsible for every piece of data that should be in there. But also every node is able to retain some sort of um, private uh, store. So this private store actually is the basis of the knowledge wallet where you can keep data privately centrally if you will but like that's your data it's not replicated anywhere nobody can access it until you sell it to somebody so it actually stays within the premises of the owner as asked in the question <coughs> therefore actually the compute the data is possible through the, that service layer it's envisioned to be one of the potential services that you can offer so you could technically do a, an exchange to the knowledge marketplace you could you could purchase an algorithm that runs on on your data asset which is locally on your machine and then verifiably outputs um, some compute result with actually your data never leaving the, the premises of your, of your node. Um, however, this is in development. This is still not, uh, not, not possible at this moment, but this is something that's envisioned in the version six of Origin 12 service layer. Um, what tools, services is DKG developing within the OntoChain project? Uh, well, to reiterate, we're building the knowledge tool stack. So that's the knowledge tokens, knowledge wallets, knowledge marketplaces and knowledge tenders, and maybe just a few more sentences about them. They're basically open source uh, services that you can take and build on top of. So it's kind of an SDK rather than a full blown solution. And it has a set of smart contracts in there that enable you to mint these knowledge tokens to enable you to deploy these knowledge marketplaces. But it also has a set of services which are basically written in, in, um, in, in for, for this iteration in JavaScript that you can really just integrate in any website. So very easily you can just like plug it into your website um, and mint knowledge tokens through it. And you can point to existing contracts or you can deploy your own. Um, so that's a very rough, uh, I guess, simple um, exp explanation. Uh, there's more on this uh, on our uh, Medium blog post and on our website. So if anybody's interested, and also I'm here. So if um, anybody wants to ask uh, from the audience, at least here or on Twitter, if you're online, Find me online and um, I'm happy to answer more questions. Do we have more time or actually we don't have more questions? So perfect, I can go grab some coffee. Uh, there's one more, I guess, latest question. Is there an ontology for the types of assets knowledge in the graph? If not, would that be beneficial? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I generally get this question about ontologies a lot. Um, and the just to generalize a little bit more, the idea of the, the DKG is not to impose any sort of ontology. The idea is that it's very neutral so that the ontologies can be built on top um, uh, as part of what is necessary for application. It consider it more as a very agnostic uh, graph database in that sense. Uh, however, uh, there's um, obviously we cannot go without any ontology. So for the protocol uh, operation, there's two ontologies that are an, uh, basically at the bottom of how the, the protocol operates. Um, and one is actually a very um, simplified uh, JSON-LD uh, attestation or assertion as we call it, ontology, which basically 
is kind of like your git commit. So you can have an, a knowledge asset and it can change state. The graph can evolve over time, but each one of these um, new uh, states is actually an assertion. And this assertion is a very open uh, JSON LD structure where you can basically fit in anything you, you need or you want um, in an ontology sense or structural sense. So I guess that could uh, answer the question. But yes, absolutely, the ontologies go on top and they're very, very beneficial. Okay. Super, thank you. So thank you, Branimir, once again for your presentation and for the energy that you brought to the Ontogen Sun. <laughs> so again, if you, as you saw, if you have any question, you can post it on Slido again. <coughs> so the next uh, project is called Eidos and is coming from OpenCall2, founded project from Ontogen. And uh, the speaker will be Juan Miguel Navarro, who is a professor at Catholic University of Murcia, and he is going to explain A-Trace and ADOS for any IoT sensor blockchain enabled. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Well, I am Juan Miguel Navarro, and coming from a university in, in, in Murcia, in the southeast of Spain. Uh, this project is uh, uh, what uh, Ontochain call soul projects. Uh, it's a six month long project. And uh, we are two entities. Uh, one is Cubic4, is a small company that they are expertise in, in, in blockchain technologies. And uh, also the, the university where uh, we were working for a long time in IoT uh, devices and technology and also machine learning. So uh, our proposal was uh, ADOS, uh, AirTrace Decentralized Oracle System. And we, I'm going to explain to you briefly uh, our main contribution in this uh, short project. And uh, finally, I will, I will show you as a short video with a mock-up of, of the service working uh, right now. Okay, uh, the, the acronym is uh, to explain that we develop a, an advanced uh, AI-based Oracle system for securing of chains IoT data integrity when injecting in, in the blockchain. Uh, our project uh, all start for from uh, AirTrace. AirTrace is a, a software as a, as a system uh, platform that uh, take uh, data coming from several IoT devices and uh, inject uh, in blockchains. So uh, it has two uh, different uh, ways to, to interface or with, with it. Uh, we have the, this visual, that is a web user interface for uh, IoT integrators that, that mm, they don't know uh, about uh, blockchain technology in, in deep. So uh, it's easy for them to take uh, the, their uh, devices and uh, start injecting in the, in the blockchain. And the, the other possibilities uh, using programmatic, where we have a, a complete RESTful API. Uh, and in this project, we have incorporated uh, different IoT protocols that we, uh, I'm going to explain you later. So in this kind of uh, integration, you can use uh, a API with HTTP in order to, to, to trigger and, and launch all the uh, interaction with the, with the platform. But uh, with different use, use cases when uh, with our customers, a problem, a problem appears that why anomaly detection in blockchain IoT domains is, is important. Uh, as everybody uh, in the audience uh, knows when when the uh, data is in the blockchain is unmutable, yeah? it cannot be changed. And what happened is, is uh, one 
uh, car that is sending data to, to the blockchain is, is hacked or, or is uh, have a malfunction, uh, what we call anomaly, yeah? Uh, once the data is in the blockchain, it cannot be, it cannot be changed. So uh, we think uh, to give a, 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 a approach for solution to this, to this problem, in order to, to quantify uh, the quality uh, of the data, yes, before injected in the, in the blockchain. And this is what we are trying to do in this, in this project. Uh, we use, uh, these are the, the, the three main contributions of, of, the, of the projects. The first one is uh, to use machine learning uh, algorithms with uh, distributed computation. So we train a, a, a graphic neural network, but the, the, this uh, trained uh, model is uh, are executed uh, with a distributed computation. You see, you see, IE exec uh, a cloud service uh, as a partner of and on the chain. The second contribution is uh, uh, we create a, or we define an ontology for these IoT machine learning models because uh, we thought that uh, they are many, many, uh, plenty of different use cases. And uh, uh, we are trying to, to reuse these trained uh, uh, networks for, for easiness of the customer. So they can go to the, to the platform and, and, and choose which is the use case that fits m most for, for this uh, kind of, of IoT devices. And finally, uh, we extend uh, our API uh, for integration of this uh, machine learning algorithm and with uh, third parties. Let's talk first about the uh, machine learning model for deeper understanding. Uh, we did uh, a, a deep uh, research about the state of, of the art of different machine learning model related with uh, multi, multi vari variable or multivariant temporal data. That is, this is IoT networks. And uh, in general, mm, the, the algorithms are mm, mainly related in order to, to detect these three kinds or three types of anomalies. They are the most uh, simple uh, algorithm that try to, to detect point anomalies where the, the newest or the last uh, algorithm try to also obtain types for collected anomalies or for a collection of individual data points showing anomalies or finally, contextual uh, anomalies. So uh, we go through the different uh, the different kinds of, of neural networks, and finally, we choose to use a graphic uh, neural network, but it's a kind of mix between uh, graphic neural networks and C and N, as I will explain later. So, uh, because uh, why we use graph uh, neural network? Well, as a similar, like my colleague uh, explained uh, before, with graph, uh, with graph network, you can uh, not only define the nodes or the data alone, but also the relations and the connectivity between them. So in this way, the collective anomalies uh, can, can, be, can be detected. Uh, in the right side of, of the slide, uh, you can see uh, the four main uh, steps of our, of our approach. Uh, in the first step, we uh, depart from what we call sensor bandit. We have 
uh, 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 n number of sensor with input inputs. This sensor can be uh, heterogeneous, so we can mix uh, uh, different kind of of sensor, water sensor, noise sensor of a uh, car, uh, everything together. And with this input that is uh, changed in, in the time domain, we est extract the, the sensor at bendis. What we do with the sensor at bendis? In the left side of the diagram with the second phase, uh, we train the, the, neuro the neural network uh, creating a, a graph structure. So this is the part of, of learning. In this, in this phase, the, the algorithm learn relation between the different nodes and create what we call edge. Edge is the different uh, arrows that connect uh, the nodes. So this learned relation will be later uh, used in the third, in the third phase the graph addition base uh, for a casting. So uh, when we have the, the uh, it's important to note that the, the uh, training phase is uh, unsupervised. So uh, we use uh, past data of the, of the, of the IoT uh, devices when they are uh, working properly in order to, to create this graph with the ground truth. So then, using the, the forecasting, we uh, create a, a scoring about the deviation between the observated data and the prediction that the, the algorithm did. So uh, using that, we can, we can detect anomalies, like point anomalies and also uh, collected anomalies. Here it is the architecture of uh, our solution. Uh, in the bottom side of the diagram, it sits the customers. Uh, our, our main main client are IoT system integrator and IoT platforms that uh, use the, the, their data. <coughs> yes, uh, below it, it, we have the uh, middleware this middleware, uh, we will talk in about uh, it later. It is based in the, in the ontology, ontology using Web of Things uh, standard. So the middleware will be the one who can uh, extract different use cases for different customers. And well, then we have the air trace together with the ADOS uh, alg algorithm. Uh, at the top of that, we have the uh, IX set, uh, the IX set is a structure where we have different workers that work together in order to run the, 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 train, net, the train net network. Hmm? We are going to, uh, we are going to uh, storm the different model ways in, in uh, IPFS or also in AWS, and also we are going to, to promote uh, periodic model training because we are working with uh, um, vari variable that are um, changing in time, so it needs to, need to be trained uh, periodically. Within the project, uh, we propose to, to use data from three different uh, scenarios. Uh, moreover, we try to, to simulate uh, different kind of IoT devices, but also uh, one of them, for example, acoustic sensor, we use uh, that all the sensors are the same. Uh, in, this, in this case, we use uh, data from, from an acoustic sensor uh, that are used to monitor sound pressure level in the city of, of Barcelona. So all the sensors are the, the same type. I, I, in other scenario, the water quality sensor is uh, related with water treatment plants 
And in that case, we have uh, water level, water quality, valve status, uh, flow rate. So it is a use case that is more uh, 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 heterogeneous. Um, and finally, uh, we try to, to extend that using uh, not only temporal, but also uh, a sp a special or uh, GPS uh, data with uh, understanding the, the, the dynamic uh, of uh, scenarios in, a, in a car traffic in, in cities. Uh, the other contribution is uh, the ontological resolution middleware. We are based in, in different uh, web of things uh, standard, but at the top of that, we uh, use it to, to create uh, uh, the, the different model version, uh, see if T is needed. So it is the machine learning model specification. What is related with the, with the we have here the, the, the visual part of, of the platform. You can see here that what is, uh, we, we are going, we are going or we are creating a, a catalog of different sensors. This is the uh, sensor leads and uh, with different uh, categories and, and, and manufacturers and each of them will have this uh, key and value trying to specify the, the ontology related with, uh, with the models. Uh, now I would like to show you uh, uh, a demo with a, with a video. Can you help me to, to run it? On the team colleagues, uh, can you can you mute the the sound? No, five minutes. Well, this is the, the main website of the of the air trace, but uh, here is the login of the of the platform and I will show you the, the main uh, the main option that we have here. Yeah. First uh, in the top part we uh, will show you about how to create sensors. This catalog that will help the IoT integrator in order to to create his projects in this sensor leads uh, you have different categories available there that are uh, something that we are working on at and for each category you can select uh, water quality or other and and define the different key and value uh, that will be related with the with the ontology in the in the model then from the from the point of view of the user the first layer is uh, a project. Here we have a, a, a project of, of the demo for the Onton chain. And uh, we have created a, a, a deployment inside a, a project that is a, a what we call a spot. There are the, the different points and we can define several sensors inside of the uh, spot. This is, uh, this is a use case related with the water quality with, uh, I remember that, 12 different spots. In, in one spot, you can have several, several sensors. What is important is that each sensor will have a unique ID, and this ID is used directly to create a customized API for uh, post information to the to the platform and also to get information from the from the past uh, from the platform here when when we create a sensor then if uh, we can choose between uh, http protocol and also nqtt in this case yeah, i think the, we have here the http protocol and the different yeah the, the different functions that are available in order to uh, get or retry data, inject it. Uh, let me stop. Yep. Oh. Can I? Oh. 
going to go forward. He's here. Yep. Oh, thanks. Uh, sorry, sorry for interruption. Uh, what we have here is o o using the NQTT protocol. In that case, uh, some one of you will know if they are familiar with uh, IoT. NQTT protocol is the most used for IoT devices. And this is the, the service that we create here. Uh, all, the, all the data that is coming from the, from the devices are uh, stored uh, periodically when we call bucket because the, the, the data is not injected directly to the blockchain. So we can create different periods of, of bucket, one minute, 10, uh, 15 minutes, uh, also one day, depending on the frequency of the data. Uh, and then <coughs> a trigger is launched uh, when the, the period ends in order to, to uh, compute the ADOS algorithm and after that, it is injected to the to the blockchain. Finally, uh, finally, uh, finally, I want to show here what's happening. Why well, is going now? I want to show you here, uh, this is the Postman that we uh, simulate. We simulate the, the, the running of the algorithm, of ADOS algorithm, yeah, to trigger the API and in, or in order to compute all the f mm, quality factor of the, of the data. As you can see here, this is uh, real data from, from this uh, use case. And, and you can watch here the uh, last column obtained by the uh, machine learning algorithm with uh, zero or one, depending if it detects an anomaly or not. So finally, the data uh, uh, with uh, including this uh, scoring factor will be injected in the in the blockchain. <coughs> Let's continue with the. Finally, uh, we have here future extension. Yeah, it's had been a hard work for us in six months to obtain that, but we have a lot of ideas in order to, to extend all of that. Yes, uh, we want to include the, the, training, the training phase also in a distributed computation way. Uh, other tools that we want to add to this platform is to all graph tools in order to uh, interpret and analyze the different anomalies that we can see there with different colors for different clusters of, of devices and also the edge and the arrow connection in order to interpret these collective uh, anal uh, anomalies. And finally, uh, we want to explore other different uh, machine learning techniques and also statistics. Uh, classical techniques. 
Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you on chain and uh, all the partner. And also I want to, to uh, thank Luis Castillo, our uh, coordinator during this uh, uh, travel that it was fantastic. Thank you very much. So if we have any question for Juan from here. Slide, but there is one. Uh, we can open it just a second. Yes, please. Hi there. A couple of questions, um, and perhaps a bit basic. The first one is why put this data on the blockchain? Um, and the, the second one is, how does this fit into the wider onto-chain network? How can the third phase, ap third phase applicants potentially plug into some of this work? Uh, I have to clarify that we, we don't we don't inject all the data in the in the blockchain. What we obtain is. Uh, like a hash or a to token, so the the data is uh, stored in a in a normal database. We have been mm, talking with uh, with Digi Digi A Digi G uh, project in order to collaborate in the future to uh, uh, make uh, to store the data of the of the IoT devices in a, in a knowledge uh, graph database. So instead of uh, recording or storing all the IoT data, we only uh, store the, the hash that uh, certificate the quality and the injection of the, of the data. Okay, and about the second question, uh, we think that uh, the hard work we have done with uh, IXET for con the computation, the distributed computation, could help to other third, third parties in order to to reuse our API to uh, ex execute other machine learning models in this uh, distributed computation way. I think that this question is for the uh, previous, for the previous uh, project. Uh, or I could answer it. Hey, everybody. Uh, so the question is, why embrace a Kala network? A Kala is one of the the most interesting pair chains in Polkadot. I encourage everybody to look at it. They're focused on DeFi, and uh, we believe that in order to build uh, really a, a, a proper web free knowledge economy, we need the components of DeFi to be part of it. And as we're building a decentralized knowledge graph and not DeFi, uh, and as, as an ecosystem, we're partnering with others, uh, companies such as Ados, as they just mentioned, um, Akala was a perfect choice for us uh, be building an origin trail parachain. So with, with that said, um, um, we are working together tightly actually on building solutions that work cross-chain, uh, which is a, a thing that uh, is actually relatively easy to do with Polkadot because it's, it's kind of a, a core premise of Polkadot to be able to do this. Um, so that's in short why Akala Network. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for being here and for your contribution uh, to the Anti-Chain Fund. <laughs> so the next uh, project is another project from OpenCall2. It's called Desmo LT, and Lorenzo Gilli is going to present the project. So I have just to remind also the next speakers to keep the time in 15 minutes. And when you hear the ringing from my phone, please try to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you. OK.
Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Gigli. I'm a software um, architect at a company called uh, Vimy and a researcher at the University of Bologna. Uh, today I will talk about our project, uh, Desmo LD, from the second open call of the on-chain um, uh, project. And actually this is another uh, decentralized Oracle solution for uh, the Internet of Things. Um, okay, uh, let's start talking uh, a little bit about, uh, about our company. Uh, Viami is a pretty young uh, startup uh, based in the north of Italy. We are mainly focused on uh, data interoperability and uh, semantic technologies. Uh, our main domains are range between uh, smart agriculture, industrial IoT, and basically uh, monitoring systems like ASHM monitoring systems or environmental monitoring systems. Uh, regarding blockchains, um, this is actually our very first project, so it's our first step into this new field. So um, before moving on with uh, my presentation, I need to give you a couple of tips, let's say background tips, in order to understand better our system and our architecture. Uh, so as you know, the um, Internet of Things is um, like exploded in the last few years. And right now we have plenty of protocols, uh, standards, uh, data formats, and different solutions that are very hardly interoperable between them. So we have this huge interoperability problem here, and um, for this reason we are actually using uh, the standard, as Hadus, for example, um, called uh, Web of Things. Um, this standard is actually from the W3C, and we are uh, part of the uh, working group developing, developing this in the past years. And um, this standard is pretty cool because it does not define like new protocols or APIs, but on the contrary, it chooses a descriptive approach. So if you, uh, if you take a look at the standard, there is like um, a core component called uh, the, uh, the web thing, which is actually an abstraction of a physical or a virtual entity. So a physical entity, for example, could be something like a device, like a sensor, like an accelerometer sensor or a humidity sensor. And a virtual entity could be something more abstract, of course, like a room that could contain like multiple devices or a building. And these items here are described using uh, standardized metadata collected inside a document called the thin description. Uh, if you take a look at this diagram here, for example, this, the web thing of a lamp could have multiple interaction affordances. Uh, for example, could have m um, different properties that you can, you can read, like the status of a lamp or the location or the vendor name, for example. And also um, different actions that you can call, like um, uh, an action for toggle uh, the, the light of the lamp or dim the light. And also events that you can uh, subscribe and listen, like uh, overeating, for example. The other very important piece of the puzzle here is the thin description directory, which is like um, a service that provides a search mechanisms for collection uh, collections of thin descriptions. So you can use this to register your uh, own devices and then retrieve them in, in the future. Uh, in this, uh, in the Desmo LD project, uh, project we aim to provide uh, a fully integrated distributed solution for uh, consuming basically IoT external data and also for um, triggering um, actuators. So we um, basically are inside the scope of uh, decentralized Oracle and um, also decentralized uh, data sources. If you take a look at our uh, high-level architecture, we, it's clearly that there are like two uh, major blocks here, like the on-chain uh, part of the architecture, which is actually um, composed by two uh, smart contracts that are developed and, um, let's say, controlled and deployed by, by us, by Vime. 
And there is also an off-chain uh, off part that is composed by uh, um, the Oracle application, uh, which is also uh, an application developed and uh, controlled by, by uh, our company. And this application is executed inside the iExec uh, mm, secure environment. And then we have um, the uh, Web of Things theme description directory, which is an open source project that we are actually developing, developing in this uh, open call, for this, uh, for this uh, open call. And this is not a piece of the architecture uh, that we are deploying or controlling, but this is actually controlled by other parties that are willing to um, join our network and bring their devices and their capabilities into, into the system. We have actually um, some partners uh, from the industry that are willing to, to uh, bring their own devices, make them public and make them available for our clients. Uh, if we take a closer look to the uh, on-chain side of the architecture, we have the, uh, our Desmo LD hub contract, which is like a registry for the um, TDDs. And this registry, basically, it has mm, some basic, basic operations, like crude operations, like uh, the re registration of a new TDD, um, unregistering, or st stuff like that. And this contract is also responsible for selecting um, a, a subset of TDDs that they will participate in a new request. It also keeps track of their reputation over time, which is very important. Uh, the Desmology contract, uh, it's uh, on the other end, it's like the entry point of our system and it exposes an API for basically retrieving data from devices and triggering actions. Uh, this contract is also very important because it manages the distribution of the token uh, among the different actors um, inside our protocol. On the off-chain side, we have the Oracle DAP um, that, as I said, is a decentralized application written in Node, executed inside the iExec platform. And basically, it's in charge of uh, parsing and translating the queries come from the, uh, the chain and submitting them to the um, network of the uh, TDDs. And basically it will collect the data from the selected web things and after a validation it will uh, return them to, to the clients. The thing description directory, which is the last piece of the architecture, uh, this is like our let's say, main search engine of the system. It stores the thing descriptions and it provides uh, um, an API with crude operations and search operations with different type like JSON path, X path, or SparkQL. And uh, um, this piece uh, uh, of the architecture is uh, um, a W3C uh, discovery compliant API. Um, and it also, our open source implementation uh, will have additional uh, capabilities like geospatial capabilities that are like crucial for uh, our use cases and our, uh, our system. Uh, if you take a look here, this is a very simple diagram and where you can understand the dat data life cycle, the data flow. So a client like is submitting a new request uh, to the Desmolity contract and the Desmolity contract contact the hub for getting a subset of TDDs to put them inside the request. Uh, all the payload is then submitted to the uh, Oracle DAP and the Oracle DAP basically quer uh, queries the selected directories to retrieve the thing descriptions. And the thing descriptions are then um, uh, processed and the web things are consumed and basically the Oracle DAP will um, retrieve the, the data that uh, are asked by the clients and after a validation process uh, executing inside the Oracle DAP, it will write the data back on chain and make them available for the requesters. Uh, we um, have also um, uh, yeah, let's say the Desmo LD uh, mm, uh, system is also powered by an ERC20 token that it will be probably the, um, the, the on-chain token. And this token is used to allocate resources in the network. Um, we have different actors here. 
the TDDs are, of course, our data device provider, let's say. And in order to join the network, they need to stake a certain amount of tokens um, on the, uh, during the registration process. And after this, they will be able to earn um, query fees and rewards for their services. This, let's say, registration tax is used for um, basically de incentivized like fraudulent behavior or uh, harmful behavior that could uh, compromise the integrity uh, of, of the network. Uh, a small portion of the query fees also goes into a pool called the, the Desmo pool. Uh, this pool is um, used, um, it's not used right now, uh, but it will be used in the future for implementing and powering like extra features and extra um, reward mechanisms for uh, TDDs and maybe other actors. Last at, but not least, the clients that are basically the guys paying for uh, the service. <laughs> and the clients are likely to be like uh, developers or projects that are willing to pay um, query fees for their applications or their services. Uh, we really believe that uh, the next generation of blockchain applications, they will need to access and interact with, let's say, the external world, um, maybe uh, with IoT actors. And basically, Desmo is built for, for this. So we have thought about a few use cases that maybe make sense in this, sen in, in, in this project, uh, maybe for the third open call, uh, like smart grid energy sharing systems where you need like to buy and sell energy between different, different users, different actors, and you will need to, um, a, if you want to create this in a decentralized way using smart contracts, you will need a way to contact like the physical devices to make the transaction, the energy transactions. And another possible use case is uh, the implementation of um, electric vehicles distributed platform. And also in this case, you will have, uh, you will need a way to access like for vehicle data and maybe also triggering some actions on them like unlock, locking or unlocking them. Uh, also automatic insurances like for example, the care chain, care chain project uh, of the second open call. And like when a contract need to trigger automatically some payments or micropayments uh, based on some events that are occurring in the physical world. Uh, this is our uh, roadmap. This is the current, uh, the in red, you can see the current project status. We already uh, developed the, um, Oracle application, the Desmolity Hub, and a kind of skeleton of uh, the final front end. We have uh, still some stuff uh, to do here. In the following month, we are going to finish the implementation of the thing description directories and uh, the Desmolity contract. Uh, for the end of September, we are thinking about deploying everything and make it available for the other, other partners, other, other actors in the on-chain ecosystem. So thank you for the attention. If you have um, any questions or... No, no, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, very nice presentation. I just was wondering, and maybe some uh, people from the audience are also wondering, um, was there a special need for um, <coughs> executing inside IXEC these uh, multiple oracles? Uh, well, uh, we want to have like a redundancy of this. Uh, basically, uh, we don't want to have like a single Oracle application doing this kind of operation for uh, a question of, let's say, trustability, because we want to be able to check that it, it's 
acting, um, let's say, uh, accordingly to the, 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 the correct behavior. So we want to have like multiple instances that are actually e executing the same, the same code and be able to verify that they are processing the correct uh, directories, the correct web things, and validating the data in the same way. So this is the main reason uh, why we put... Uh, and is this computation happening in a trust execution environment? Yeah, it is. So what is the adversary scenario here? Uh, for, for implementing in this way? Yes. Like, oh, well, if you have, like, just an instance of the Oracle DAP, you can, there is, like, a single point of failure, and you can, if you have been, I don't know, if you have uh, been hacked, for example, you can write on chain and retrieve, like, fraudulent data, uh, false data, and you don't have a real way to understand it. So this is the main reason why we did this. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Actually, I have another question. Okay. So since I see that nobody else, I wanted to, to give the floor to others to ask, but uh, you mentioned at some point um, that you maintain the reputation of the various... Uh, yeah, uh, we are... At the hub. Yeah. At the hub, you maintain the reputation yeah. of uh, the various, uh, like, oracles. Yeah. Um, first of all, what does it mean that you maintain reputation? I mean, how you maintain, where you maintain? Yeah. And... Uh, is this, uh, I mean, you didn't say anything about how you maintain, I mean, if it, is this a simplified, let's say, reputation yeah. algorithm? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, it is right now a simplified version. We are just giving a score on the, the Oracle DAP is giving a score to, result, to the result of the uh, TDDs, and then we are just writing them inside the app. But um, the idea here is to integrate with uh, the project, the reputable project, and maybe use, use their system, which is actually way more uh, sophisticated, <laughs> to be able to implement, uh, let's say, a more strong and meaningful reputation system for the TDDs and uh, our, 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 our Oracle. Yeah, many, many things. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, and thank you for being in time. <laughs> so after finalizing the projects from OpenCall 2, now we are going to a project that is coming from OpenCall 1 and it's called uh, Copyrightly. And uh, Roberto Garcia is going to join us remotely. Uh, I don't know if we have him on Zoom. Okay. Uh, Roberto, can you hear me? Uh, can you try to speak? Yes, I'm okay. speaking. We can hear you now. If you are okay. ready, you can start the share screen and the presentation. Okay, I will start now. Okay, so I suppose you can see my screen now? Yes, okay. Okay, perfect, thank you. So, uh, this... Uh, talk will be about uh, copyrightly that comes from from the first call this tool is basically uh, the intention is to add uh, an authorship and rights management layer to to want to change from the point of view basically a uh, copyrighted content so that is that you can claim authorship on any piece of uh, content or to also to provide supporting evidence that you are the, the creator of that piece it's also uh, in the intention for the future is not yet implemented is to be able to also file complaints uh, against uh, potentially infringing authorship claims. Uh, the evidence uh, that can be added to support claims and also complaints, uh, it's uh, the idea is that it is, it is stored in, in blockchain, it can be also uh, used in case of uh, going to, to the court in case of uh, litigation but also that can be used on chain uh, we, uh, through uh, arbitration uh, mechanism. And also that uh, that behavior of the, of the blockchain, that everything that you store there is uh, stored for forever, 
it's also a way to disincentivize false claims because uh, then you have to be held responsible of, of these kind of, of claims. And a critical aspect here is also that you can uh, uh, attach in, in, uh, in a way the legal identity to the identity on chain. And this is also so, something that we explore with uh, participants in the, in the first call. Additionally, to help uh, curate that list of claims, so it's not free to claim uh, others' content, the idea is that we also implement uh, a system based on a token that helps us curate that uh, set of uh, um, claims. Okay. Uh, it also has a short-term uh, incentive about, uh, about false claims because you have to stake this token on your claims. So you, in case of litigation, you can lose your, your uh, stake. And also there's another economic incentive that uh, this token is tied to a bonding cube. So the more it's used, the, the, the price will increase. So it is that it's also interesting for uh, token holders uh, to, to to hold that on the longer term and stake it in, in, in claims that seem um, uh, seem good. Yeah? So it's also an incentive uh, for the participation on this uh, ecosystem. And finally, uh, and the final contribution is that uh, once you have provided evidence, you have a stake on, on uh, provide a stake on your uh, authorship claim, you can also, um, uh, license that piece of content through NFTs, and it is these uh, NFTs will not be just uh, pointing to the creation like it's typical right now. And it's one of the biggest problems is just pointing to the image that can be easily copied. The idea here is that it's going to be pointing to the authorship claim, so you can have the whole uh, track of evidence, litigations, uh, everything that you might need in order to get uh, an audio. Uh, more uh, trustful idea about if that is a legitimate uh, NFT uh, rooted on uh, something real. And also the NFTs that you can mint in this uh, system, you know, if you want to uh, purchase some kind of uh, license on the, on the content, also uh, are tied to the specific terms that you get uh, with, that, uh, with that NFT. So it's not like just generic ownership that at the end doesn't have to do anything with, with copyright is a set of terms uh, that you can also use in case of, of litigation. So uh, going into details, uh, basically one of the main mechanisms uh, in order to make this ecosystem uh, trustful is uh, the use of this token curated registry approach uh, through this CLI token that I was mentioning. Uh, you have to stake on your claims, so you are putting some risk there if you try to make false claims. It's also used by anyone that wants to uh, complain against you. They should add an equivalent or bigger amount of a stake on, on the complaining side. Others can also participate in case of these arbitration uh, situations, adding the stake to both uh, sides. And uh, in case uh, there is not a, a winning uh, side, a clear winning side, in, given a, a time uh, span, uh, our idea is also that you can uh, appeal to the, the decision through existing uh, court or, or on-chain courts uh, like the, the project Cleros. Okay, this is the architecture of the, of the application. Basically, we have a set of smart contracts that are currently deployed on the Rinkeby Ethereum testnet that deal with the different aspects uh, of the application from the manifestation that will be the authorship claims to the evidence, also the, the complaints. Uh, all the content of the different um, uh, kinds of uh, manifestations, for instance, if it's a video, if it's a picture and so on, Everything is stored together with the authorship claim uh, on decentralized storage, in our case, IPFS. So we don't uh, store the actual content uh, on blockchain, just the, the hash, the content hash. And then for evidence, we also have envisioned a system that using uh, oracles is capable of uh, using existing social networks APIs to bring information about the social networks uh, on chain. So we can also use, uh, for instance, as evidence 
that you have previously published that specific video, for instance, in, in YouTube. Uh, the whole system, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, uses uh, NFTs as the way of packaging uh, the semantic data, that is the, the reuse conditions for a piece of content. This can be easily integrated into existing uh, NFT marketplaces and also with the rest of the on-the-chain uh, ecosystem. Here you have an example of an actual uh, license NFT. But we can see that it's a uh, semantic NFT in the sense that we have extended the typical JSON metadata in the RC721 standard. Uh, with the use of JSONLD, we can uh, enhance that uh, metadata with uh, semantic metadata, in this case, using the copyright ontology, so we can uh, tie to the NFT the actual uh, rights that are transferred to the owner of that, uh, of that uh, NFT that is actually licensing uh, these reuse conditions on uh, the corresponding creation. And then also, from the metadata, you can also go back to the ownership, ownership claim, to the evidence, and so on. So you can track the, the whole life of the, of the authorship claim. Then to finish, in order to be quick, we have uh, published uh, a demo online that basically brings uh, the, the viewer through a simple uh, use case. That is someone that has already a video on YouTube and wants to monetize that piece of content outside the traditional mechanisms that are provided by YouTube. The idea is that you can upload uh, usually a higher resolution version to uh, decentralized storage, making an authorship claim. So you can prove that you have access to the original piece of content. Uh, so in case of litigation, you have a stronger uh, claim. Then you can also link it to uh, your uh, YouTube uh, video. So you also have here the benefit of uh, the additional copyright uh, infringement tests that are made by YouTube. So if your video is still published there, it means that it doesn't infringe anything, any other content that is registered on YouTube. So it's a, a good proof. You just take some CLI in order to show your commitment on your authorship, cli uh, authorship claim. And then you can start minting NFTs in order to license uh, your, piece, uh, your piece of content. And these are NFTs that then can be traded on existing marketplaces. So if I go to the video, I will just try to go quickly over it. Okay, here you can see that this is available right now online. You can uh, log in with your, uh, for instance, uh, current wallet. Uh, your uh, account is used as the ID of the author. You can, here you are, uh, yes, uh, register a piece of content. You can upload the content to a PFS, but you can also keep it uh, local, just compute the hash. So you can, in case of litigation, upload the content later. Because the important thing is that you have the hash, the original uh, hash of the content, and a way to prove that you had access to the piece. Okay. Uh, then the hash is computed. In this case, it's also been uploaded. We just uh, signed the, the transaction. So this is going to be recorded on chain. We can track the transaction through, for instance, in this case, Etherscan. Also, the application is going to be alerting us uh, as soon as the uh, transaction is accepted. So you can go back to the newly created uh, authorship claim. Here, the author is warned about uh, the conditions in order to be able uh, to consolidate this authorship claim, like adding additional evidence and so on. Here, we can see that the content has been, has been also uploaded to IPFS. We're browsing IPFS in this case. And also, the other uh, commitment that has been done, in addition to adding some evidence, is to stake some, some CLI. So uh, now we will see how we can uh, add evidence of this YouTube uh, video. In order to do that uh, through the Oracle, what we do is to ask the user to add a specific piece of content to the uh, video description on YouTube, uh, given the, the video ID of that uh, video we want to, to link. Uh, so we basically copy that 
piece of content that is basically a, a pointer to the authorship claim. And this is the way that later through the Oracle, we can check that uh, that user that is making this transaction is also the user that has control. Uh, he's the uploader of the video because he was able to, to add that description to, to the video. And the Oracle is basically checking the API, YouTube API, bringing that check back to blockchain. So if everything uh, satisfies this, this, uh, this check, yeah, the, the YouTube evidence will be registered on chain two and linked to the authorship claim. We can add other kinds of also of uh, evidence uh, like documents, pictures, whatever kind of content that can be uploaded to IPFS. And once we have uh, staked some CLI, added at least one evidence, we can start also minting uh, NFTs. And that is the option that now appears as possible. Here we can uh, define the conditions, uh, the, the reuse conditions that are given to the owner of this NFT that we are minting. Uh, just uh, by minting is uh, the same process is done uh, by signing the corresponding uh, transaction. So just uh, the, the author uh, the, the, who has made the authorship claim can do that. Okay, so here we see basically how the transaction is uh, signed. And after that, we have the NFT that has been minted. Uh, the metadata, uh, the semantic metadata for the for the uh, NFT is now uploaded uh, to IPFS and linked to the NFT. So they are now uh, tied together. And we have here even a description of these conditions uh, in plain text. So they can be also used in case of, of litigation in addition to the uh, ontology-based uh, claims. And uh, finally, in addition to seeing the transaction, we can also go, uh, for instance, to OpenSea or Rarible, where, because this is a standard uh, NFT following the, the, the 721 standard, it has been indexed also automatically some minutes uh, after the minting process. And now you, we can trade as any other NFT, uh, like making auction or listing or making offers and gaining uh, the rights uh, that are uh, provided by this uh, NFT. So that's all from my side, more or less speaking to, to the time. And now I'm open to any questions or, or comments by the, by the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto, for being in time and thank you for your nice presentation and uh, for being in on the chain summit and for your contribution to the on the chain community. So now I am ready to take any question for Roberto if from audience here. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm just curious about the progress of the project. Like, have they commercialized in any way or deployed? Is it being used? Because uh, it looks very interesting. Yeah, uh, we have uh, continued working on the project. For instance, we have participated in some hackathons where, for instance, we have improved uh, user or, or creator's profiles so they can link to social networks and so on. We haven't commercialized it in, in any way. So we have contact with different uh, companies in the media industry that is, are interested in, in, in different parts of the project. Thank you for your answer. Any more question? Uh, I'm Andreas. Uh, just a question on. Uh, the, it, it reminds me a little bit like uh, like the Bowler uh, project that is also in the onto chain uh, open to call too. Uh, uh, not not Bowler. Sorry, um, missed the project name. Co what you do is uh, you, uh, you're creating the copyrights in the end. Um, and uh, I would like to know if uh, if the data would be able to to get 
um, catched out of the net to, to provide for other platforms for, for identity checks in the end. So you know, Bowler was it, uh, the open uh, chain call too. They, they did the, the um, kind of a rating um, approach in that. Do you see that? Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. Okay. Which you provide copyright data for NFTs in the end, and that's a kind yeah. of, it's, a, it's also a kind of a rating what would, would be able to do with that. Because you could say this is a, 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 you're not only going on, on copyright, you can also say that the uh, smart contract is, uh, good, co is uh, uh, good coded and all the traits are okay. So um, it's, it's like a rating uh, uh, tool, could be used as a rating tool, like Bowler did or is approaching. Well, basically, we are not. We are creating this copyright data. Is basically what the author the, the author is uh, wanting to license. The actually the, the rating is done through the CLI token. When you stake on an authorship claim, uh, it's like uh, a rating of how you see that as a trustful and you uh, are confident that uh, who is making the claim is the actual creator. That is actually the mechanism that has been used to, to provide uh, this rating on the quality of the authorship claims. If you call your NFT at, on OpenSea, for example, um, I mean 80% of the NFTs that listed on the OpenSea were scams or fakes or whatever. So you could provide the, uh, with your solution, you could provide security on, on platforms like uh, OpenSea in a kind of a, of a rating. So if you, if you call your NFT, like a browser plugin or whatever, uh, that pops up and you say, okay, uh, with this NFT, all copyrights, uh, they are clear, it's, it's fair, it's okay, it's, uh, it's no fake, it's no black yearism or whatever. So that, that was, would be my approach on that. Yeah, it's true that some sort of um, rating number can be derived, but what we think is the uh, added value in our case is that you just not have that rating that you can go from the NFT to the authorship claim, uh, see all the evidence that is stored there. This will be done manually in most cases because uh, deciding if something is original or not, usually it's difficult to do automatically com uh, in a computerized uh, way. But it is that you can track all, uh, all that information. One derived uh, rating is that people will do that and then stake on uh, authorship claims that seem trustful. So it's like a uh, derived measure of this uh, rating will be that people will not risk to put the stake on claims that it's easy to complain because you can lose your stake. And we envision also that will be people that is just uh, devoting their time to check for authorship claims. If they identify some that uh, might be risky trying to go to, through complaints in order to uh, just earn the stake that is in, on that authorship claim. So this is an ecosystem that will evolve in that, in that sense. At least this is, is our vision in that regard. Okay, thank you. So Roberto, we have one question from Slido. And the question is, how do you see any collaboration with Open Call 3 projects? Well, uh, our vision is that uh, from the moment that you have, for instance, uh, these authorship claims packed as NFTs that you can easily index, there is a whole opportunity now that is the, the, what we didn't uh, do <laughs> given the time that we had in, in, the first, uh, in the first call, is for instance, adding mechanisms that index all the, uh, this NFT metadata allows them to search here, we can also envision mechanisms to use the semantics that are inherent to this metadata in order to make also reasoning on that information, also derive uh, measures of uh, trustfulness of, the, of these claims based on the stake that is in there. There are many, many ways uh, that this uh, authorship layer can then be extended through, through Call3. Thank you. We have another question from here. Hello, Roberto. This is Thanasis. Um, so, uh, I personally 
don't see the connection of your project uh, to Boulder, but I do see the connection of your project uh, to another two projects that we have an open call to, probably because you are uh, a project of the first uh, open call, um, and uh, we haven't been able to publish uh, the results of the second year projects yet. You don't know exactly the developments that have been uh, happening in um, uh, in the auto chain project currently, but we have very very interesting projects. Two very interesting projects with uh, whom uh, I see immediate uh, chance for collaboration with you. One is called NFT Watch, which is about uh, metadata annotation of uh, NFTs based on uh, processed information that can be found online. So I mean, one can easily imagine that uh, in this uh, semantic annotation you can also Im embed claims of ownership and uh, I mean uh, really e enhance the trustworthiness of the NFTs which are listed. And another one which is related to the trading of uh, NFTs is uh, uh, NFT swap uh, that uh, actually uh, is a price determination mechanism for uh, for uh, NFTs, employing liquidity pools and bull and bear tokens, uh, which uh, again, uh, I mean, uh, would benefit from a uh, connection to the ownership of, uh, or some claims of ownership of the NFTs for, uh, for the market creation. So um, I see that, um, I mean, I, I, I see this, uh, uh, this potential collaborations and uh, maybe we can take it offline how to proceed with this. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very interested in this project. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for your answers and thank you everyone that uh, had a question. So now we go to the last project for this session, uh, which is uh, another project from OpenCall. One is called Reputable, which is about producing the centralized um, reputation system for blockchain uh, based ecosystem and uh, it will be presented by uh, Junaid Arshad uh, who is a uh, associated professor at the Birmingham City University thank you for being here and welcome i'll just present your slides um, good morning everyone I think it's still morning, right? Um, yeah, my name is Junaid. Um, I was leading the team who developed Reputable as part of the Open Call One. My other collaborator who couldn't join me here, um, he's still in the UK enjoying the sunshine, believe me. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, present overall, you know, concept and uh, where we managed to uh, get to as part of the open call one and what possible next steps are uh, for this project. Um, to set the context, we um, we were interested in uh, <coughs> in this project because in the collaboration with OntoChain because OntoChain uh, is aiming to kind of develop a trustworthy internet platform. Uh, when you hear about word trustworthy one of the first things that comes up in your mind is, uh, you know, how do you measure that? How do you, how do you uh, represent that trustworthiness of any entity? Reputation systems are one of the mechanisms whereby uh, we kind of as humans um, assess or ascertain uh, trustworthiness of things. For example, uh, trustworthiness of sellers on the marketplace, on eBay or on Amazon or anywhere. So uh, that's why the um, reputable. So we, uh, we think reputable is going to be a core component of uh, onto chain uh, ecosystem or any, or, or hopefully can be adopted to any other blockchain based ecosystem, um, generally speaking. Um, so yeah, we, we think that reputable can actually achieve that, can, can be the um, um, the infrastructure that enables trustworthy interactions uh, between 
sellers and consumers between different entities within a, within a marketplace. What Reputable does is it, uh, it delivers a cross-platform. Uh, it has the potential to deliver a cross-platform privacy-aware reputation system. So we, this privacy awareness is very, very important for us. We want people to be able to provide feedback about a, a seller, about a service, but uh, be able to do so in a private manner so that, uh, uh, you know, their identity or the link between the feedback and the s uh, and the uh, and the and the buyer in this case, or the user in this case, ca is at least hard to decipher, right? To avoid collusion um, and so on and so forth. What Reputable does is it it leverages blockchain technology. Of course, we we here on a blockchain community. It leverages blockchain community uh, blockchain technology to achieve decentralization. Decentralization is very important uh, for anything that would, uh, that, would, um, that would sit on top of a blockchain infrastructure because uh, if anything is uh, not, uh, you know, um, not decentralized or cannot be decentralized, it actually compromises the decentralization property of blockchain that you get anyway. Um, and, uh, um, Reputable also uh, leverages blockchain, blockchain to enable verifiable uh, calculation of uh, reputation scores. So it's one thing to say that, okay, I provided a feedback and uh, uh, the seller got, let's say, a five-star rating. But uh, then being able to see that my feedback did indeed contribute to that five-star five rating is another thing. That's what, that's what we call as the verifiability that my feedback was indeed included uh, in the calculation, and that's what we, uh, we uh, aim to achieve. Um, as part of Reputable, we, uh, in terms of interactions, we, we did want to have two different kinds of users. One is a programmable interface so that people can, uh, services can, can use it, and the other kind of users is human users who can actually, for example, uh, I said, I want to verify whether my feedback was indeed used or there are other kind of entities, I will touch on that. So all of this, uh, what, what are we plan to do? This is the um, overall architecture of Reputable. The, the brown kind of bits are where our, most of our implementation <coughs> was. Most of them are smart contracts. Um, so in order to understand this very, a little bit of complex picture is to start from the left. Um, so you have users or consumers, right? We're, we're imagining an um, online marketplace scenario just to make it simple as in how our system would work. Um, so a user buys something from the seller or the marketplace. Um, after that, um, there needs to be a communication between the seller and the, and the, and the buyer to, say, to ask them to provide feedback. Uh, that is done by seller issuing a token, a unique token, uh, and uh, you know that user using that token to provide the feedback. Now, in because from here, from this point onwards, everything is based on the token, not on user identity, which is why we don't need to kind of protect user identity because we're delinking the token and the, and the user's identity anyway. So everything is based on token. Um, the user then provides a feedback in an encrypted form. So we're not asking plain text feedback or any feedback that travels in plain text. So the, the encrypted scores are then used by something called an aggregator, which aggregates the feedback um, in simplest form. It could be an encrypted sum. Um, and then what we trying to, what we did in uh, um, as part of Reputable was to store uh, individual feedbacks, individual user feedback on an off-chain store and uh, aggregated feedback on the, uh, on the chain itself, right? Um, there are many reasons for that, but one of them is uh, performance. So number of items, number of uh, data points that you want to save on, ch on the chain, uh, performance efficiency becomes a, becomes a compromise. 
the reason we wanted to save individual user feedback on off-chain is because although we have already created, although we already use those uh, individual feedback, individual user ratings to create aggregate feedback, we still want to use them for verifiability to provide uh, further analytics to the dashboard that you can see at the bottom of the, uh, of the screen there. Um, so overall, our objectives are a few of them. Um, firstly, we wanted to achieve anonymity of feedback which by delinking user identity, which we, I just explained we do by, uh, create by using tokens which are uh, currently um, issued by the seller uh, for in individual users. So each user has a unique token. Um, we, we developed the overall aggregation, uh, aggregate reputation score for the seller based on uh, user feedback. Um, we also capture the provenance uh, of the reputation score while uh, throughout the whole process that I, that I shared earlier. This is achieved through um, decentralized oracles. Uh, the oracles we have, uh, we experiment, I'll explain more in implementation what we did there. Um, but we use Oracle because these are uh, external services that we have to connect with. Um, we store reputation data, aggregate, both aggregate score and raw feedback. Raw feedback on uh, uh, off-chain storage because there can be a lot of it um, and we need to do some more processing for verifiability. Um, so, um, although we do store um, aggregate feedback on the chain and uh, individual feedback on off-chain, but uh, there is a link between the two. So once the aggregate feedback is stored on the chain, we, it is linked with all the feedbacks that were used to create that, off, uh, create that aggregate feedback, right? So for example, if you get, a, let's say, if you have uh, 10 users supplying feedback about a specific seller, you use those 10 to create an aggregate feedback. Now, there needs to be a link between these two, so that, that link is uh, created by taking the hash from the, uh, from, from the aggregate uh, data stored on the chain uh, to create that link. And that uh, also helps us with the, uh, with the verifiability of, 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 the, uh, of the reputation score. Um, we do provide, uh, we, we implemented a query interface. We wanted to provide that uh, two different types of them, one for human users, but at the same time providing an API uh, for other services and applications that, you, that may want to use it for. Um, we, I seen in uh, one of the uh, presentations earlier who would like to use reputable, uh, reputable as a service and that's the kind of uh, consumers we're looking for in this. In terms of the proof of uh, concept implementation we achieved at the time, um, we, we implemented a web form as you can see on the right. So there's uh, a simple web application where somebody uh, buys something, whatever. In this case, it's a fruit shop um, and uh, is able to provide a feedback uh, by getting a, a token in an email. Um, well, the simplest form. Um, we, in terms of the uh, proof of concept implementation, I mentioned earlier we had to uh, work with the uh, oracles to so that we can gather information from off chain and store it on chain. We experimented at the time with iExec and chain link, uh, but because we were um, a little bit time constrained as well as some challenge technical difficulties with these two platforms, we developed our own uh, proprietary oracle, um, which still needs some more uh, work, but uh, we, you know, uh, that, that was the best we can do at the time. Um, um, we, as part of the, uh, our implementation, we saved, we stored aggregate uh, reputation score on, in a, you know, on, on the chain, um, Ethereum uh, test network, um, whereas individual store, uh, scores were stored off chain in a cloud storage. 
um, and which which become then uh, we implemented that dashboard which was an interface to the which is an interface to the uh, that cloud storage uh, what the dashboard provides is it provides uh, users to be able to uh, query and verify individual user feedback in an encrypted form right so everything is encrypted um, even though if you can see a user feedback, it's encrypted, so you can't tell if whether what whatever uh, actual feedback is, and the aggregate score for a seller is also queryable. So, but of course, this functionality can be extended uh, for uh, future use cases. Um, in terms of our key innovations or contributions that we've uh, that we've made. Um, we have been able to achieve a user-centric reputation modeling and calculation. I, I mentioned earlier, everything's based on a user feedback uh, that the user provides after conducting a, uh, a verifiable transaction. So um, all feedback, all the user feedbacks that we get are based on, are a consequence, well, a consequence of um, valid transaction. Um, we have been able to achieve privacy preserving user engagement so we de-link the identity of the user from the feedback they provide we have been able to achieve verifiable reputable uh, reputation calculation we provide a way to do that um, uh, we have uh, been able to achieve end-to-end -end decentralization as you as you saw earlier in the in the architecture and uh, uh, we, I think, uh, our implementation is able to interoperate with other um, services of the ecosystem. In terms of our targeted users of Reputable, um, it can be marketplaces. Um, for example, you have um, Amazon, eBay, and other marketplaces where a seller proudly mentions <coughs> they are a five-star seller or four-star seller, so they are sellers who would like to use uh, this kind of service to provide a verifiable um, reputation score for their system. Uh, there's users who want to ascertain trustworthiness of, uh, of the sellers, which is our perspective in to the problem. And then there are reputation management systems, you know, who conduct um, reputation analytics for their, for, for their clients, for their customers who want to gather more intelligence from uh, uh, from such systems to ensure uh, to improve their reputation in terms of next steps our we were able to achieve the proof of concept uh, basic implementation but uh, um, I wanted to end on where, where we go from here right um, our proprietary oracle is one of the one of the things that we uh, that I personally want to improve so currently it is a centralized, uh, it was a centralized component. Um, and I know there are options like iExec and uh, Chainlink and others. But uh, um, th this is something that we want, we want to explore um, further. We have, since uh, we finished the project, we have explored more uh, in terms of what we can do with iExec. Um, uh, not within this project, but uh, isol in, in a more isolated manner. And there are opportunities that we can do. Um, but there are also things that we can, we can do with the proprietary Oracle itself. Um, but, you know, um, we, yeah, so this is one of the, the, the few more open questions around that. But yeah, this is one of the dimensions. The other dimension that we spoke about a lot with uh, with our mentors in uh, onto chain was the use of side chains um, because i mentioned earlier one of the reasons we didn't want to store individual user feedback on the chain was because of performance uh, constraints and uh, to achieve performance efficiency and to make it scalable but also to make it more cost effective because each transaction costs some dollars, right? Um, so we want to explore the use of side chains to, uh, you know, um, to ad address all of these different constraints that we have. We have uh, 
uh, we have explored uh, Polygon for now for in, in a more isolated way, but we haven't actually explored using uh, sidechains with uh, reputable uh, in this case. We, this is something that we're continuously looking and uh <coughs> looking to improve it. The other, the, the last step I would mention here, the last challenge is more on in terms of how we do reputation calculation. Currently, our, what we did was a time window based uh, kind of reputation calculation. So after a certain specific sp specified time, you take all the user feedback and you calculate reputation based on that. This was another thing we discussed quite a lot with our mentors at onto chain that we want to achieve a more real time kind of uh, operation, right? So that we have you have a more kind of near real time uh, assessment of uh, uh, a seller's reputation or trustworthiness. So this is something else that we we want to explore and we want to achieve. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, feel free to ask, or I think we're overran, but uh, available here, available afterwards to, you know, um, discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Junaid, for being here and for the contribution to the Alton chain. So this was the last uh, presentation for this session. Now we have a coffee, coffee break for 15 minutes and we will meet you in the next session, which is about brainstorming. So see you in the next session.
brainstorming. Hello. <laughs> What does the brainstorming mean? It means to have a storm of inspiration, apparition of something higher. So shall you start? Peter is missing. Okay, so do we have any participants from the internet? Okay. So, uh, thank you for being uh, with us for this next session. This is about. Uh, some brainstorming on uh, some key issues that uh, concern us and the on-chain community in general. Um, so we will have, uh, I mean, the intention of this session is to have an open uh, discussion with the audience, both here and remotely. Uh, it's going to be facilitated by the, uh, it's going to be facilitated by Slido, uh, but also uh, we will make uh, our best effort to include everybody, all ideas here. Uh, so, in the panel with me uh, will be uh, Vlado Stankovsky, uh, Petar Kosovsky, uh, Antony Simonembulo, and uh, Alberto Chiaramella. Uh, so, they will be able to say their views on the various topics. But also, we need uh, some contributions from the audience. Um, as you will see, the discussion is, is going to be really open. The topics are uh, really generic. Uh, they, they trouble all the blockchain community. And uh, solutions and solutions are uh, not straightforward. Okay, so let's start. What, is, what are the objectives of this session? Uh, maybe we, we need to identify some uh, core essential features that we may miss currently or that we have to embed to this uh, software framework. Um, and uh, we want to discuss the various trade-offs that may affect the positioning of uh, onto chain in the future. Uh, the position of onto chain in the whole blockchain landscape. So, uh, we are going to discuss about application domains. Uh, what is interesting, uh, if we have uh, covered everything, are there any killer apps? Um, about infrastructures in general and uh, competitive platforms, let's say, competitive not to us, but competitive to each other. Uh, we are going to talk about quality of service. This is a very big topic, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, as you will see. Uh, what is the quality of experience? What is the quality of service? How can we uh, deliver something which is of expectable quality? Uh, tokenomics. We had several approaches in, uh, in the morning session regarding uh, tokenomics, uh, I mean the projects that employ some form of tokenomics in their uh, projects. Uh, so we will uh, discuss uh, uh, on high level on this uh, particular topic and how they can help us. And uh, finally we will conclude with the uh, ecosystem su uh, sustainability in terms of uh, extensibility, scalability, expansion, uh, maintenance. So, um, this, uh, I mean, I started with putting some uh, thoughts yeah, in some slides, but uh, these are just for kickstarting the discussion. So, uh, you will be able to express, uh, to speak your minds about uh, the different vertical domains. So, 
Just some domains that we have mentioned uh, either today or in yesterday presentations uh, is the automotive uh, domain, the smart cities, smart grid, finance, health, insurance, commerce in general, logistics, data analytics, data sharing, the gaming industry, metaverse domain or extended reality, virtual reality, uh, and the services domain. So, uh, first question for uh, the panel and for the audience would be, are there any kind of fundamental vertical domains that could be added in this list that where we actually may have some uh, interesting applications? Okay, <coughs> I uh, will add in uh, vertical domains, vertical arts, which is a very important, different kind of arts from uh, uh, tradable NFT uh, arts and so. Uh, other are uh, agriculture, is the agriculture we consider uh, at least as a domain of uh, quality of service, of uh, quality of foods, uh, um, certified quality and so. And uh, in any case, also tourism, especially in, uh, in consumer to consumer uh, tourism, something like this uh, in general. Moreover, uh, in any case, uh, to uh, have a full categorization, we have uh, to have a two uh, level categorization. Uh, because if you mention only one vertical, there are many other of applications, some of which are killer and some are less important. So there is another uh, slide that follows uh, for applications. Uh, so here we just need to identify first the verticals. Uh, I don't know why it does this, maybe, sorry. Okay. Moreover, I will add that in some sector there are some kind of uh, conservative. We have to explain why uh, you are using blockchain. For example, health is extremely conservative and uh, make, uh, use, uh, make, uh, ask you some question about. Okay, other views? Actually, I'd like to hear from the audience. So do you think that we miss some of the sectors or approaches in our project? And which would be those? What would be the immediate sectors you would really think that would benefit from blockchains? We see some uh, answers from the audience the remote audience at least, uh, transportation, agriculture, tu tourism of, as uh, mentioned by Alberto, transportation, education, smart industry. Well, I d I d that education for me is really a primary because if we can start with educating people, then uh, this is like, let's say, one step before we go to maybe some more industrial applications. Uh, thanks, Thanasis. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess I feel better not turning my back to people. Uh, hi, everybody, I'm Branimir again. Uh, yeah, I think it's, this is a very worthy discussion, and uh, one thing I wanted to point out was that what's uh, with the question of where blockchain would be useful, as everybody kind of tries to figure out that, I sort of like to approach it from first principles thinking. So obviously, as there are trust networks that provide this ability of, um, sorry, too close to the speaker, somehow encoding shared trust, right? And trust is great, and it's a necessary precondition for value. So if you want to have um, any sort of shared value, for example, in education, uh, diplomas are valuable, certificates are valuable, right? If you have it, you pay for actually, I don't know, thousands of euros or dollars, uh, People, there's this famous uh, U.S. Uh, uh, situation where people go and to, to college and like incur hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, tuition debt, right? That, that not that debt. Uh, <laughs> so, um, 
So it's definitely valuable, and uh, in the end, the outcome of that is some sort of certificate or micro-credential maybe in the future. Uh, but essentially, looking down towards like the bottom or the first principle, trust here enables value. And this value, um, I think, in every sector is possible. There's everything in, uh, in the industry or really the economy that generates value could benefit from blockchain in terms of uh, if this necessary component of trust is, is there. And um, I think uh, the, the, the list is quite exhaustive. Um, and um, I'm curious if that's a question maybe for you guys, really, um, if um, once we expand the list, uh, do we want to dive deep into some topic? Okay, cool. Yes, uh, okay. So I think that uh, we have some answers here and we have um, also several uh, domains uh, mentioned in the, uh, in, the, in the slide previously. So as uh, Branimir said, uh, whatse whichever domain uh, needs uh, some form of uh, logs uh, historical logs or uh, uh, trust which are maintained uh, in a trustworthy manner, these logs, uh, could benefit from the blockchain technology. But uh, if we go down a little bit and uh, see what we had identified or as some uh, application examples for uh, Open Call 3, uh, you see there are some uh, uh, 11 basically applications that we pinpoint um, as potential killer apps for uh, for onto chain uh, just to remind to the to the people uh, I mean we were talking about logbooks in general maybe related to what uh, I said before uh, uh, related to what Branimir said decentralized fact checking uh, for uh, data credibility online for social content decentralized online social networks semantic energy data management smart cities, uh, smart city applications, and we actually we are more uh, specific there, like um, uh, garbage management, it could be like uh, emissions management in a, in a smart city. Uh, the automotive industry and uh, uh, the roadside management and uh, insurance and communication interoperability, distribution logistics, uh, data, marketplace sharing, um, semantic based uh, DAO, this is for, uh, in general, for organization of, um, let's say, collaborative endeavors uh, in many domains like fundraising, like, uh, which is related also to B10, uh, decentralized public services and common goods, so uh, local uh, fundraising and uh, public goals and uh, uh, public goods in general. Uh, so remote metaverse is a different uh, domain and uh, okay, uh, the last one is just open to everybody, but still, uh, we are not sure about that. Are there any killer app ideas missing here and do you actually want to propose something? Yes, please. Uh, I have a more fundamental question for you. You were talking a lot about trust, and I have a kind of problem with this whole industry regarding trust. How do you want to gain trust if even here we have seen Ponzi schemes, scams? How do you want to solve this? How do you want to get rid of all these scams, all the Ponzi scheme? We're not going to achieve any trust for normal people who are in this industry in all these industries, if we are not solving this problem, if we are not solving <coughs> all this greedy mindset, all this money, yeah. How do you want to solve it, basically? Um, I s s one thing I, I often say is that um, Web 2, Web 3, they tend to represent or model online um, actual social interactions. So you will find Ponzi's and scams in blockchain, just like you find Ponzi's and scams in real life, and just like you find you can uh, be scammed when you walk into a supermarket. Um, 
what I can tell you is that because it's transparent, because of the blockchain, because there are um, decentralized consensus, you have a little more trust in what you see. You can see the code behind the application. You can trace back to what happened. You can trace back to the origin of the data. Um, with all of these services, you will be able to uh, understand why decisions were made, why content was provided or suggested to you. So, so, so you're basically saying uh, at this point, people are getting scammed. So you're, wh what you're saying is just, that's just how it is. People get scammed. Yeah, people yeah I'm get sorry. Into <laughs> schemes and yeah. we just accept that. No, we don't. Um, we don't accept it. We, we keep fighting. We provide tools to... How? How do you fight? By making, by making it transparent. Um, That's it? When yeah. Yeah, basically. Uh. Uh, if, you, if, you go on, if you go on Amazon and you buy, you buy something from the marketplace, uh, sometimes you will get scammed and you trust Amazon to make it right. Um, can I add sure. to this a little bit? Um, you know, in my viewpoint, uh, this semantics uh, that we discussed, I mean, yesterday in the beginning, is actually um, could be used to describe value. So, um, I mean, uh, the meaning of money uh, in history of humankind, I mean, money does not exist for, I mean, maybe they started in Persia three, four thousand, thousand years ago, or they discovered some monetary means uh, around this time. So humanity has not used uh, money for quite a great deal of existence. And I think that by uh, semantically describing things, the value of things, um, it would be much easier for, for people to, to compare value. Because the value for us is what we can make use of it. You know, the money is like just um, a representation of value, but the price is actually, uh, we all know, very subjective to all of us. Uh, the best things in life are priceless. I, I also wanted to say something. I mean, regarding the, this uh, Ponzi schemes and uh, how do we really establish uh, trust and uh, so, uh, actually, I don't know if you know, uh, if you have uh, written about, the, uh, read about this. I mean, there is no unique notion of uh, reality or there is no unique notion of truth. So, uh, truth or reality are determined by some majority. Uh, so, this is exactly what is happening in the blockchain domain where we establish some consensus on what is exactly happening. And we register, and we record, and we log it. And if something happens, then we can trace back and see what exactly has happened, wi who was liable for this, and maybe do something about that. So Ponzi schemes will exist, will continue to exist, but I have to tell you that at some cases, there are holes in the mechanisms that people exploit so that they can really violate the rules of the game. Uh, what we try to do here with this semantics that we annotate uh, with uh, the data, uh, that we annotate the data with this semantics is to be able to, to make these holes to the different mechanisms built by people much uh, more difficult to appear. I mean, to cover the holes, that's the whole thing. Uh, to make this, um, th the, future the, the future developments, uh, developers of dApps, to give them more tools so that they create more trustworthy protocols. That's, that's my take on this. But if there are any other opinions, uh, we can continue this or we can go to the next. Yeah. Um Hi again, um, again, uh, Branimir. So um, to, to your question, I, I think it's a noble question. Uh, I do think though it's, uh, as I agree with all of the panelists that talked about, it's such a complex system, this world, that we, uh, you know, uh, we need to cover things step by step, hole by hole, right? So um, unfortunately, blockchain is being pitched as the ultimate solution for all trust issues in the world and, um, and then some and then some pitch towards people's greed, which is also well part of everybody, I guess. We all are to some extent greedy, uh, hopefully less than more. But uh, there's always going to be a bunch of people who are. And then if you exploit 
that hole in the system, greed, and that um, the hole of maybe not knowing that much, which can be um, mitigated quite a bit, if not solved with semantics, which is what we're talking about here, plus the mechanism of whatever exploitation being tra transparent, also making it harder or easier for somebody to understand that something is a scam. Anyway, you're kind of like, it's such a layered system that it comes down to like, you know, who it's who is being exploited and if that that person is able to leverage the tools and that uh, ideally the tools are as good as possible to to assist this. So I think it's a journey, it's never gonna end. Uh, but yeah, it's unfortunately something that's been put on this industry because of a little bit of that history and the hype. Uh, but I think what's what's great about uh, ecosystems like Ontochain and other similar ecosystems that are building real stuff rather than magic voodoo money um, is is that we're actually doing uh, something something um, which will go in that direction. So um, okay. actually okay. really happy to be part of this this okay, initiative. Let's, for let's that. move on because we have uh, other interesting topics to to really discuss. Uh, thank you for these uh, interventions. Uh, maybe we can take them offline. The rest of the discussion. Um, so let me go to the next uh, topic. So first, first topic was the applications what and what we, we can do uh, for them. Second uh, topic is about the infrastructure. You know this, uh, I don't know if you have seen this uh, uh, triangle. Since you are here, probably you know it. Uh, so it's this uh, Vitalik's uh, Buterin uh, uh, famous blockchain uh, trilemma. Uh, which is about the trade-offs between scalability, decentralization, and security of uh, blockchain systems. Uh, in my view, this was not the complete uh, story. So, just just some thoughts. What about energy efficiency? Okay, how where the energy efficiency lies there? Because there are uh, very secure centralized solutions that uh, consume uh, less energy. Uh, decentralized solutions that are uh, equally secure or even more secure that uh, consume more energy. And what is the relation of energy consumption with uh, security? Um, what other issues we have, like uh, incentives for the decentralization for people? I mean, why people care about realization? Is it something about empowerment. Uh, what about the efficiency of the whole system? Where the efficiency lies in this uh, domain? I mean, is it here? Is it there? Is it in the center? Where is the efficiency? And uh, what about user expectations? So actually our previous, um, our previous guest from the audience said, uh, uh, I mean, said something about uh, how do we really ensure trust in these systems since there is so much fraud in already deployed blockchain infrastructures? So this is about user expectations. I mean, people believe there is this hype that Branimir said that people that uh, blockchain can really bring uh, full trustworthiness and uh, the crime is not going to be there anymore. So we will solve all problems of humanity. This is not, uh, I mean, this is, just a user expectation, which is acceptable, and we have to understand them and re record these expectations. So, okay, uh, any views on this? Maybe we can start with the uh, panelists or with any of you, or remotely in Slido if anyone wants to make a reflection. So, okay, let's start with uh, Anthony, you wanna start with this? How do you perceive this in uh, IXEC? C can you pick one of the four topics or <laughs> do you want me no to no address no. all you of them? You, you just see the picture, picture and see where do you lie. Um, so usually my, my vision is, um, is that we should have a clear definition of, of what decentralization means. And to some people, decentralization means that uh, Everything, everything must be open, that the entire world uh, must uh, be involved in the process and that we should have a lot of scrutiny. My own vision is that decentralization depends on the end application. So for example, if uh, 
me, you, and Vlado are in a business process. Uh, we exchange goods and services. We don't need to be on Ethereum. We don't need to have uh, millions of nodes. We don't need to have millions of miners. We just need to, we can have a blockchain that has three nodes because none of us this way can have a control on the chain and none of us can cheat, none of us can change the records. Um, so we can have something that is decentralized and very energy efficient just because um, the node, the blockchain validators, for example, in the case of proof of authority, are well distributed. This is my own view and of I don't know how this applies for onto chain because we want something bigger and, um, and uh, open but I don't think that for onto chain we need to go to uh, proof of work and millions, uh, million of miners. So I'm not so much concerned about energy efficiency. And the same goes for scalability. But there is a question that we, um, we started to, um, to address, but we don't have the answer yet, which is how we will grow the network. Uh, because right now we have eight nodes. I know that some people including in this room, uh, want to be part of the chain, uh, are interested in uh, adding a new validator. Because of the consensus protocol that we chose, we cannot add uh, an infinite number of validators. Proof of authority typically uh, scales all right until 12 validators, and then it crashes after um, 16. Um, so we'll find a way, we'll have to find a way to involve more partners, to, um, to involve stakeholders in the chain without necessarily having them as validators, and I don't have the answer to this question. By the way, if in the audience, uh, if, in, if in the audience anyone has an idea of how we could do that, should we switch to a different protocol, consensus protocol? Uh, someone mentioned yesterday that proof of stake uh, in the, I like proof of stake because uh, it allows you to be part of the network without having a validator, but like someone said yesterday. Yes, it can, be it can become an uh, oligarchic, uh, let's say, scheme this proof of stake. Um, so you see here, just to introduce this slide, <coughs> you see here several uh, kind of consensus protocols and how they are um, really influencing this, uh, influencing uh, the whole discussion about uh, infrastructure and energy efficiency. Um, also there are these uh, uh, different uh, scalability approaches like uh, layering, like side chains, uh, also, there are uh, in the play these blockchain integrators like Cosmos or even Polkadot can be considered that. Um, and you have this alternative uh, blockchain networks that want to build everything from scratch. So, um, so there is some uh, mobility, let's say, around. Um, I don't know exactly where this is going to converge. Um, and uh, regarding these uh, fundamental questions that we have in, uh, we had in the beginning, uh, for me, this uh, proof of work thing is about uh, is uh, I mean it's, it's about okay. You mentioned this uh, example of three nodes, but okay, w maybe we can trust each other and we can exchange services with these three nodes. But do we really? Um, uh, do, the, do, do we really appear to be trustworthy to the external people with three nodes? And um, do people feel empowered when they do not participate into something? So I think that, um, I mean, this whole discussion about energy efficiency and all this kind of um, war towards proof of work doesn't really uh, doesn't really have this perspective in mind. I think that doesn't care about this. Yeah. Well, uh, when we speak about energy efficiency, it's uh, a really wide topic because as we know, energy uh, itself, it transfers from, from one state to another. So uh, when we speak about energy efficiency, a part of um, uh, considering the fact that uh, all participant participating nodes should uh, consume less energy. Another thing that uh, could be also taken into account is how the energy that they are using can be um, uh, used uh, more, um, well, ca can be used better. For example, uh, we all know that in the proof of work uh, 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 protocol, uh, the nodes are using a lot of com computing power and 
during that process they also um, uh, also produce a lot of uh, thermal power. So in other use cases like uh, power plants who are also working with energy, the uh, the additional like uh, thermal power they produce, they uh, find ways how to spread it in the community. So people, a part of the electricity they um, gain from the power plants also use the thermal power from those things. So in, uh, in our case with the blockchain, uh, there is uh, the energy, uh, well, the thermal uh, energy that is created and uh, maybe that can be also incentivized by some ecological standards if they're met by the miners. For example, if you're following certain uh, standards for reusing the energy that you're producing, then uh, you should be also incentivized for that thing. So that's another maybe thing that's that a, can that's be considered. A, that's a great idea, I think. So. Uh, any other reflections? I, I would like yeah, go. I just think the um, these two things, to some extent, are related. Participation in energy uh, efficiency. If you want to, I just think if you want to encourage uh, wider part participation, or you know, across uh, number of different users, then not each of those, not all the users will have. Uh, you know, high power machine to be a miner, for example. So in order to ensure uh, wider participation or uh, true decentralization, uh, energy efficiency is really important. Something, I think, you know, this is a next generation internet project. And uh, I mean, in my viewpoint, in the future, even every single property in a graph could have its own security requirements and uh, these proof proofs of uh, application level proofs that we have uh, would, um, you know, because there are trade-offs. The more security, the more energy <laughs> you use and uh, the less, uh, I don't know, uh, the speed is uh, of operation. So uh, if you have um, to prove the presence uh, here uh, to the bank, it's not the same as if I want to prove it to my friend. So this type of security requirements should be defined in the graph. This probability should be there and then we should apply to every, every property in the graph the type of consensus me method we want to have in order to prove something or to generate any other property of data that we know of that are like multiple properties possible. Um, so I think in the future this type of um, this decentralized, I mean there are conferences on decentralized and uh, distributed uh, databases uh, for 30 or so years. So I think um, these concepts will evolve in near future and we will get more and more optimized blockchains that will not be generic just for everything, but they would even work on specific properties in the graph, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, okay, we have some more views. Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, something and put another, just, just a second. I just wanted to, uh, I mean, try to summarize what uh, Peter said. So he proposed a combined uh, heat and power uh, approach, a CHP approach basically, for the miners. As you have uh, now for the, uh, I mean, for, for this, uh, for the agriculture domain that you have this uh, uh, CHP power units that uh, are used in, um, uh, that they are, they are used in agriculture and at the same time they sell electricity to the network and the thermal energy is used for uh, for thermal purposes, then that could be a good, uh, a good uh, thing uh, to consider. And another thing is the, the source of the energy which is, cons uh, which is used in the network. So the source of the energy is also a very important uh, factor if it, if it is renewable or not. Uh, I just wanted to mention this slide and maybe you can reflect uh, on it uh, what we see here is from the European Observatory Forum, one, uh, uh, some, some figures. Uh, we had yesterday the European Observatory Forum, uh, Forum with us, um, Ioannis Vlachos. So uh, you see this energy consumption here is uh, from Visa uh, network. 
and uh, how the different uh, blockchains um, are compared are, are compared to that uh, in terms of um, and uh, as, co as compared to the number of transactions that they can uh, uh, their throughput per, per in transactions per second so uh, you see several uh, different networks there and uh, where is Bitcoin for example but of course Visa network is a kind of very much controlled and uh, uh, centralized uh, let's say approach so that that as Vlado said maybe not that proper to compare with so uh, there was one question uh, yes so these problems all, all come from the fact that we're talking about permissionless uh, ledger, right? Why or what's your take on saying we have open access, but the ledger itself is a permissioned ledger and we have some kind of organization managing it in some way or another? It would solve all, it would solve all these problems, um, yeah, but improve the infrastructure of the financial system. So what's your take on this approach? My personal take? I mean, maybe we can ask the panel. Who, who wants to take this? I'm not sure uh, I understood what you meant when you said um, having one organization manage. Do you mean that one organization would um, host and control all the nodes? But so, so, I mean, we can theoretically have a permissioned ledger with several organizations all over the world. Some organization, some uh, big organization managing the people participating in this permissioned ledger, right? Mm -hmm. And because you have so many different participants, uh, so many interest groups participating in this organization, um, it would kind of reasonable decentralized. You have universities, you have financial institutions, etc. But it's still permissioned. So you get rid of all these problems we have, but have a decent, uh, have not completely decentralized, yes, but some kind of decentralization without all these problems. So what's uh, your take on this I approach? Uh, my feeling is what you d you're describing is what we are doing. Um, because basically we have um, um, our pilot right now is proof of authority. We have uh, eight nodes that are controlled by the consortium. Um, so, and even if we open it to uh, other validators, um, the nodes, the validators, it's very loud, uh, will be controlled by uh, stakeholders who are interested in the project. Um, then it's pretty much permissionless. Anyone can come, uh, deploy smart contracts, exec execute transactions. And this way we have a consensus protocol that is um, not proof of work, that is a little bit more uh, per performance, scalable, energy efficient, but it provides sufficient decentralization to um, the stakeholders and the users. So I, I think, don't you think that what we described in terms of infrastructure matches what you're saying? Or is it different? Yeah, okay, uh, I think the question was uh, somehow related, but also, uh, also I mean, uh, taking the, the perspective of a closed, uh, of a permission system in general for the, for the users mostly and for the nodes entering the network. So, yes, uh, our pilot network is, go is permissioned, but uh, to make it more, I mean, to just uh, state something more generic than that, um, still in permissioned uh, networks and in permission systems, uh, there is a chance uh, of, a, of a fraud and of a scam. Uh, because, I mean, the fact that you, the very fact that you are allowed to enter the system doesn't mean necessarily that uh, you are not going to manipulate your uh, entrance there and the opportunities that you may have for uh, fraud. But in any case, this is a very generic uh, thing. I think that we have to move on. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning uh, about the quality of service and uh <coughs> there were uh, actually the users currently in the internet because we are talking about the future trustworthy internet, users have uh, 
have experiencing a certain, let's say, have a certain quality of experience. So they are used that they press a button and they see something in the screen. This is not something that is necessarily going to happen, at least for the applications of now of blockchain. I mean, the latencies are kind of different. Also, um, the throughput of the different, uh, the transaction throughput in different systems and in different applications might not be the acceptable one. So, in general, um, can we maintain the quality of experience in the blockchain domain? Can we check SLA compliance and service delivery? As for example, is happening by FairSwap, but uh, I mean the applicability of this solution is not uh, universal. Uh, and uh, how about uh, service liability? So in the blockchain domain, since multiple actors participate, when services fail, the liability is not straightforward to be assigned. So how do we deal with quality of experience and service liability? So, any ideas? So let's let's get the first question. Can we maintain the same quality of experience eventually? No. Because <laughs> there's no computer system that maintains <laughs> stable quality of service uh, anywhere. Um, but that's a question for you, actually. Um, so no, we will not. Uh, it's impossible. But can you integrate in your business model uh, compensation for uh, lost business, for example? Can you elaborate the, um, the So I, I don't remember the, the numbers exactly, but I, I read a few years ago that for every minute or every second of downtime, uh, Amazon loses uh, uh, this many hundred thousand of euros. Um, if onto chain is down for one or ten minutes, how much business will be lost, and uh, can it be compensated? Uh, if if um, the if the contributors to the network are compensated for their work, then I guess if they don't do a good job, then they should be penalized, right? So maybe yeah, it can this just be this integrated. Is the, this is related to the lost. Uh, I mean, this is related exactly to the expectations that people have from a system like Amazon. So, yes, it is. Uh, I also read uh, uh, a paper about this, that every second of uh, latency, uh, I mean, uh, creates a, a, a future loss for, uh, for Amazon and for uh, any kind of online services of some millions. Uh, so, what I, what I wanted to say here and to state here is that um, we have a system which is working, let's say. Ha it has the weaknesses that we said yesterday, the current internet, okay. And people are used to, I mean, one guy from the audience yesterday mentioned the social networks and the centralized social networks. But I'm sure, and I, am, uh, and I have experienced myself, that when you are using a decentralized service, you, you don't have normally the same quality of experience in terms of latency, in terms of throughput, in terms of uh, quality in the beginning and features. So how, how can we convince somehow the users that this is something that they uh, really have to pay or tolerate for the extra security that we offer or for the extra empowerment that we offer or for this I mean, is it an um, education, an educative approach that has to be followed, or we just have to improve? Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, address this question, actually. Uh, you know, uh, in every distributed system, I mean, it's um, very well known that there is this trade-off, and if the system is distributed, of course, it will never perform as good as a centralized system. So this is like a computer science theory supporting <coughs> that. 
Uh, now, uh, speaking about uh, liability, I mean, one thing uh, that uh, comes to my mind is that there could be some insurance company insuring edge computing uh, quality of service so that uh, once we uh, send our transactions to the nearest uh, node, this transaction is processed immediately, so the user is uh, happy and satisfied, but then it is being implemented later on on the blockchain and uh, the liability for this is taken by this organization as an example of an edge computing application. Um, uh, I thought, uh, though, that um, what would be interesting, interesting for me to hear now is uh, what kind of, for example, quality of experience and quality of service do we expect from the applying uh, projects in the third open call? Or maybe even uh, to, 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 to discuss about um, how specific uh, technologies of uh, open call 2 uh, complement or like contribute to the necessary quality of service or quality of experience that could be embedded in future Open Call 3 applications. Okay, that would be that would be another interesting point to to say. Uh, but in general, we have this uh, user end in the third year applications. So the user, I mean, all these applications have to be validated with uh, real users. So this is part of the process for validating any way that the quality of experience is going to be at least acceptable. Um, okay, so we have heard about tokenomics and uh, tokenomics uh, are about incentives in general. How do you create incentives in the system? And um, in theory, as a discipline, mechanism design is uh, related to the design of incentives, to the optimal design of incentives. Uh, however, most uh, tokenomics approaches and even token designs existing out there uh, are mostly empirical. So if you see how people, I mean, invent new coins and token distribution strategies, they seem that they are kind of very ad hoc. Uh, who says that the total uh, distribution supply of Bitcoin should, should be that, that it is, I mean, uh, one trillion or uh, something? I mean, if this is an arbitrary number. It could be one, uh, it could be 10 trillion, it could be one billion, whatever. So, uh, do we need the fundamental theory for uh, tokenomics design? Uh, that, that's the first thing about the tokenomics. Second thing is that uh, these incentive mechanisms built on top of uh, tokenomics um, are, uh, are sensitive to, to this uh, volatile volatility of these uh, cryptos, of the tokens that they involved. Can we build uh, stable incentives with tokenomics? That's another thing that, so for example, look at what is happening with the miners. I mean, that they stop and uh, more miners uh, come in and uh, the miners go out as the prices change of uh, the various cryptos. <coughs> and uh, so, but w what happened to the incentives that you want to provide in the network if you are based on tokenomics and you are dependent on the crypto price? Uh, and uh, regarding uh, network expansion with a form of, uh, with the use of uh, tokenomic governance, uh, gender equality, fighting poverty, poverty um, public good creation, value sharing, liability sharing, etc. Uh, this could be potential uses of uh, tokenomics and we have seen such ideas. But uh, do you have any kind of uh, more ideas on the... Uh, tokenomic uh, uses, so can we use them for something else that it's not has not been imagined up to now? So, to summarize, is there a need for a fundamental theory? Can we build stable incentives with them? And 
Is there any potential use that we might miss? Please. Rod. Oh, sorry. Just a short question regarding this. How about aligning legal regulations with technology? Did I say the bad word? Uh, aligning uh, regulation with technology. This is, <laughs> this is, I think, something that uh, there is. There are several efforts for this to happen, but not totally very related with uh, the topics that we discussed in this slide. I think Rapolas uh, was mentioning several initiatives to uh, to unify the, this um, the technological framework with the regulatory framework. And this is also related to the standardization. Um, but what we talk about um, here is, um, I, I mean, about the tokenomics design and uh, uh, the stability of this and uh, the uses. So any reflections on this? Maybe from uh, the, yeah. Yes but not, not many people participated in the poll. I, I, I would also agree that we need a fundamental theory of tokenomics because these bonding curves and other things are being done like based on existing monetary systems, but these are based on very heterogeneous uh, eco ec economic models. So for example, um, state uh, bank like uh, national banks are regulating this based on a lot of economic activity, which is um, done in different sectors of the economy. So if one sector goes down, other sectors go up and so on, so they can regulate. Uh, but in these cases, when crypto tokens are issued, usually they do it for one type of service. And this mean means that you need to have some sort of new type of theoretical approach to be able to uh, really um, um <coughs> align the use of tokens or the circulation of tokens with the generation of value inside the ecosystem. So the generation of value in the ecosystem, in my opinion, is the most important factor. And if we can sense that, then we would be able to actually regulate the amount of circulating coins, which would actually complement the generated value. Actually, that's, uh, that's a very good point. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the, the field that is uh, dealing with this coin distribution and uh, in general, uh, I mean, if we talk about uh, stable coins, fiat currencies, uh, basically, if we talk about fiat currencies, the, the field that uh, deals with this problem is uh, finance but uh, the problem here is that uh, it's associated with this value mentioned by Vlado of the ecosystem and how you regulate the supply of the coins so that uh, so that uh, they take into account this uh, value which is uh, uh, which is created in the in the various ecosystems but one thing is for sure that this of course, empirically, uh, we can we have to say we have to admit that even ad hoc approaches have worked at some up up to a point. Uh, but on the other hand, the instability created in this crypto market is something which is the result of these ad hoc approaches, and this volatility is part of the fact that they don't have the mechanisms to regulate the supply so that they maintain some stability in the value of the d various cryptos. Okay, let's go to the next and final topic. The ecosystem sustainability. This was, this is about how the network, uh, this is related to one question which is, uh, was uh, posted on Slido. Um, so the requirements are that the network um, or uh, if the and the infrastructure should be able to scale and expand. 
Second, that the software framework should be maintained and extended. And the question was about the software maintenance and how to do this. Um, the costs of this uh, efforts in general, all costs of all kinds, like electricity, like uh, hosting, like personnel uh, for maintenance and exten extensibility, uh, have to be covered. And uh, here we have uh, to come to the solutions. And uh, yeah, I have made some bullets regarding the potential solutions, but as you see, there is no uh, magic approach here. So tokenomics have been proposed by various people as a means to expand the infrastructure and provide the incentives to people to, uh, to do the software maintenance. Uh, but uh, as we said, these incentives can be volatile and uh, the intentions of the people may vary as the value of their tokens changes. Uh, we need attractive apps. That's where we talk so much about the killer apps and the vertical domains. Uh, there is needed some, in these big ecosystems, there is needed some alignment. So there is a need, uh, that's my personal take, there is a need for a governance model uh, to ensure this alignment among the different uh, or maybe conflicting even interests sometimes. And uh, you name what is, what else is needed for the sustainability of such a software ecosystem like O2J. Yes, uh, if I have to integrate uh, the <coughs> last solution, there are at least uh, two topics to mention. Uh, one is uh, the perceived value uh, of the solution uh, for the customer, and in line with attractive, but attractive also from a point of view of uh, cost, and uh, the other is uh, the fair revenues between all providers, different kind of levels provided. Which uh, related to the governance. Yes. Okay. Any other views? So, Anthony? <laughs> so, do we miss something there? I, I'd like to see. I mean, uh, I'd like to see really how uh, the applications in the third open call, which is like really important for us, right, are going to show that um, it's possible to achieve uh, sustainability uh, in the long term. So in my viewpoint, but this is just a personal viewpoint, um, um, uh, if we need to show uh, an application provider should be able to show that um, uh, this solution really generates an ecosystem, first of all, in which uh, several actors can exchange value and be happy about it. So uh, this is something. And then um, also maybe uh, because blockchains can be used to improve utilization, for example, of resources. So if we talk about a car sharing system, then it would reduce the amount of cars that we see in the streets because, or parked in the neighborhoods. Um, so this is uh, what would actually generate sustainability because we are going to reduce the effect, our footprint on the environment by making ecosystems and value sharing within the society uh, much more, uh, how can I say, uh, aligned with the, with the needs of the people rather than the just uh, the, 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 the consumer society. Uh, last year in the Venice, Venice uh, Biennale, uh, the Arte, um, uh, the, the exhibition was called uh, How Shall We Live Together? And uh, this exhibition was inspired by um, by uh, actually uh, our societies uh, 3,000 or 5,000 years ago. And they have really done excellent study and they see that today we just, uh, with this uh, individualism approach in the past 100 years, um, um, uh, humanity has lost some part of it. 
and um, what they they showed in this Biennale, it was a really great experience to see this, that all this um, way of living in the future could still go back to the ways we had thousands years of ago. More optimal in the sharing of resources, so not buying the book, each one of us the same book, but maybe looking on the blockchain where our neighbor has the book that we want to read and knocking on the door and getting that book and then using the reputation model of our project to you know, know that caring about the books is also important and the people who really care about the books also are able to come to us and let's say um, uh, we can share the books with them or our cars or any good that we have. So these type of things, I think the blockchains can actually really greatly contribute to sustainability. And this is the value I would like to see in future applicants from this third open call um, to, to, to really demonstrate that they are going to actually build an ecosystem that is generating such a great value. Okay, thank you, Vlado. Actually, Vlado gave us Apart from economic uh, sustainability perspective, he gave us a more uh, planetary sustainability perspective. And going back to the or kind of uh, thinking about act attractive apps that also that also uh, I mean uh, promote this uh, idea of this sharing economy. Uh, and thinking about that. Uh, and uh, regarding the ecosystem sustainability overall, <coughs> uh, as we said, attractive apps both for the clients and for the end users and for the uh, involved uh, players in this ecosystem uh, need, to need to be created. So if there is, any, if there is no other... Um, let's say, view from the audience, uh, remotely or here. Then we can conclude this uh, session and go now to the lunch break. Thank you for your participation and uh, see you later.
Miyaki and you were with her. You have the name Miyaki. Yeah, that's right. Well, I thought you were telling me how to pronounce it. I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> easy to understand each other. <laughs> when we speak <laughs> words slowly, it's easy for us to understand <laughs> to each other. Okay, so I think we're good to start the next session. So this session is uh, on blockchain success stories. So we will have presentations from uh, different projects that were funded um, within Open Call 1 and Open Call 2. Um, so three of the speakers are remote, two of the speakers will be here physically. In between each of the presentation, we will have time for a couple of questions. You can ask your questions on Slido. I don't know if you can see. I don't know if everyone knows the link to Slido, but please ask your questions uh, on Slido. Yeah, on Slido. Um, and I think we're good to go. So the first speaker is uh, are Iñaki Fernandez Perez and Diego Valdeomiros from CareChain. And they are attending remotely. I don't know if they are. Yes. Hi, Nyaki. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? No, yes. You're good. So okay. uh, you can share your screen whenever you would like. You have 15 minutes. And please go ahead. OK. I hope that you can see it well. Yes. Thank you very much, Anthony. If you could just go. Yeah, perfect. So uh, let me just, OK. So yeah, as uh, Anthony was saying, uh, I am Iñaki Fernandez, and here with me is Diego Valdeolmillos. We are from the University of Salamanca Visitor Research Group, and we are uh, involved in in a project from Open Call to of Ontochain called Care Chain, which uh, is related to supporting care using microinsurances with blockchain. So we developed this project with a, a company called Irestar Media Group, which is a big company uh, dealing with uh, mostly media and, and stuff like that. And I'm going to proceed to, to explain what's our project about. This is a five month project that uh, we just finished. And to provide an overview of, uh, about what I'm talking about here in, in this project. So the objective of this project is to create an environment to using um, smart contracts, so supported by blockchain and DLTs for parametric microinsurances, which are small uh, insurance that uh, can be parameterized uh, regarding some uh, objective values. So the idea is to provide users, so small businesses and such, uh, to receive automatic compensation from an insurance when the contract conditions are met. So to that end, uh, the technologies such as IoT and blockchain and smart contracts allow to provide this kind of uh, FinTech and InsurTech uh, technology. So the idea of uh, parametric microinsurances at their those are insurances that are executed automatically when the fulfillment of some condition in their clauses is met. So those are what we call parameters. That means, for example, maximum and minimum values or dates of, of application of these clauses. An example would be, if you look to the right, you can have a, a farmer which is contracting an insurance for the crops, for some uh, crop field. And the insurance states that whenever there's a wind uh, whose velocity is higher than uh, 100 miles per hour, for example, since damages are likely to be suffered from the wind, whether they are suffered or not, so no evaluation by the insurance company is needed, since the wind has uh, surpassed 100 kilometers, uh, sorry, miles per hour, the farmer receives automatic compensation. So what we are building here in this project is an agile and secure mechanism to contract this kind of microinsurances based on blockchain and onto chain ecosystem. So this would be the general architecture of the, of the platform that we just built. So in the middle, you would have the backend with APIs for both the front end for users, whether they are clients, whether they are insurance companies or administrators. 
we have a uh, blockchain API to communicate with the blockchain and create the smart contracts in a traceable and transparent way. We have also APIs for sensors, whether they are, they are API REST APIs for sensors or using the protocol MQTT that communicate with sensor, for example, for measuring the, the wind or such. And then APIs to communicate with oracles that are the ones that are, are going to certify the data coming from the sensor and so on. For this, we, we, we collaborated with ADOS, which is a project that uh, Juan Miguel Navarro presented this morning. Uh, which is a, a project about creating decentralized uh, oracle supported with uh, AI for anomaly detection and such. And we use their services for creating the oracles. And then another part of the architecture of uh, our project would be the role-based system in which we may have an administrator, which is called here platform manager, that manages profiles of providers, which are the insurance companies. They create representatives and the representatives interact with the uh, customers to, to sign the smart contracts. In this sense, the providers are going to create templates, contract templates that are generic templates of some insurance product, uh, micro, micro insurance product that is going to be created by the, the company. And those templates are then used by the agents or representatives to create concrete smart contract, customized smart contracts, which are then signed by both parties. This is the generic uh, functioning of the, of the platform that we have created. So for this, uh, the main innovation that uh, we have investigated in, the, in this project are the, the use and parameterization of Ethereum standards, concretely two standards, for creating the smart contracts. The one is ERC-735, Claim Holder Registry, which basically uh, allows to add, delete, and retain clauses, creating these smart contracts in, in an Ethereum network. These clauses for uh, microinsurance are certified either by third parties or uh, self-certified. And then the other standard that we use, which is uh, very useful in adding transparency to the system, is the ERC, 930 eternal storage that uh, standard what serves uh, which uh, the, the purpose it serves is to update smart contracts when they are already deployed meaning that if a clause of a micro insurance needs to be modified we can create it we can update the smart contract by creating a new one that keeps a reference of the old ones for transparency and for keeping the records in an immutable and secure way and then these smart contracts are, are going to be triggered by, uh, by data or uh, manually, but uh, for the data, the data comes from sensors from the REST API or MQTT, as I said earlier in the architecture, to a decentralized network of Oracle, which is in charge of ensuring with uh, AI that it has not been tampered with. This is the service that we take from uh, the ADOS project, which is a, a project also in the same open call too. Uh, for the solution for a distributed system of oracles in IoT scenarios like this one with microinsurances. And once the network of oracles has analyzed the data, this data is uploaded to, to the blockchain, which provides data, data traceability and allows to launch and automatically compensate the client, the farmer in our example, if a, a specific clause of the insurance has been broken. Here, I'm going to show a small video as a, as a demo. It's not very visual, but uh, keep in mind that uh, this is the, the API that could be installed, a platform that could be installed in, a, in for example, the, uh, an insurance company website that manages the, the creation of microinsurances. So here we would have the main point of view of some microinsurances created with some secure code and hashes. And then as we move on and we select one of those, it addresses us to a, a block scanning service that allows us to, to check all the data, see the timestamps, the hashes, and to verify that the blocks are uh, correct and have not been tampered with. Following this, we would have the point of view of um, a provider. 
So an insurance company that can create templates for, for example, one insurance, micro insurance product that is going to launch. And this, for example, uh, as it says here, this relates to a temperature sensor. For example, imagine a, a fridge truck that needs to transport some goods uh, and keep them in a range of temperature. So we can establish here some conditions. For example, of course, the sensor must be switched on and some clauses which are related to the maximum and minimum value of the temperature in some period. So this is a template for the micro, micro insurances that then can be used to create some micro insurance, specific micro insurance with some additional clauses or some modifications, sorry. I'm just coming back. Here. So here it would be the concretization and creation of a new micro insurance from these uh, insurances, these templates, sorry. And in this sense, we can parameterize them and provide the, the insurance company with these tools to manage their micro insurance products. So once we have seen this, here we could uh, have the, the role managing system and we can grant representatives some rights or revoke them for them, so if a, an insurance company creates one representative, which may be an agent uh, of their company, this agent can take the templates that we just seen and log on to the platform and see the micro insurances that he has created. And also he can uh, register some sensors or eliminate some sensors that uh, can be parameterized and established for uh, some concrete uh, uh, micro insurances or templates. So moving on from here to the business model, the thing is that uh, with the ability in certain parts and uh, in recent times, especially regarding COVID and, and so on, micro insurances have been growing all over the world. It was uh, an insurance product that was more popular in low-income countries and such, but now it's uh, it's been spreading all around. And the thing is that the insurance market provides services under, under market economy, so supply and demand. So now uh, small businesses are demanding small insurances, uh, insurance product, and are also in need of rapid compensation on, on agilized uh, service. So they don't have to deal with a lot of processes just for, uh, for achieving the compensation of a product that they have bought. So the, the goal of InsurTech or uh, technology for insurance is to provide tools to improve the services and customer experience with uh, secure mechanisms because we're dealing with a, with a sensitive market here. And in blockchain in, the, in this case and DLTs provide, a, provide us with a, an extremely useful tool for this. Also, other innovative technologies that are very useful in, in InsurTech uh, could be big data and AI to, for example, pricing in, in policies. So another challenge is also uh, the experts moving their work online. When I'm talking about experts here, I'm thinking of uh, experts from insurance uh, companies that traditionally have been uh, dealing with going to, uh, for example, to the field of the, the crop field of the farmer to check about the damage that's being produced. This is not needed in parametric micro insurances because the actual damage is not uh, in the clauses. What is in the clauses is a parameter like the wind that could have damaged or not the, the crop field. That way we sidestep the need for, for checking. Also, uh, the European Commission has published a, a proposal very recently to regulate transactions with DLT. So in this sense, uh, InsurTech can benefit from this kind of, uh, this kind of applications, this kind of tools. The idea, the strategy that uh, we in consortium with uh, Eurostar, the, the company I talked before, uh, for this product would be in two ways. One, business to consumer. That means an insurance company and a client subscribing one micro insurance and managing it. So this could be added to, to an insurance company system to automize 
automatize the, the process of microinsurances. And the thing is that since we are using measurable data to create a, an index and this is stored securely in the blockchain, this is uh, an assurance that uh, data is not being tampered with and it's an assurance as well that uh, compensation can be paid and automatically uh, triggered with no, no further implications and no further problems. Additionally, in a business to business insurance company, this could also enhance services in the sense of agilizing and reducing the need of uh, paper uh, transactions. This would reduce managing cost, and this would provide also a secure and agile mechanism that they can use and simplify the, for example, the, the training that is needed for, for their employees. Barriers that we can find here, uh, mainly we, we deal with regulation barriers regarding what I said before about uh, the default paper requirements that, uh, that are usually asked for in insurances. This would not be needed in a, in a platform such as ours. Uh, also some other requirements when the, we are uh, outsourcing insurance activities. Uh, um, so you have two one minutes. to another. Okay, understood. Thank you. And, and then testing requirements about the products or the insurance products. This could change it if the regulators could facilitate some exchange of information. And that uh, is the line that we're uh, starting to follow with, with the company with this product. Finally, uh, some forecast about uh, the business model. We are aiming to, to charge uh, clients for subscription to the, to the platform, to the, to the use of the platform in, a, in two ways. One monthly uh, 990 and another 1490. The difference is that the previous one uh, is to provide a financial stability. So it's a, an annual si subscription. So uh, in the end, what we're foreseeing is uh, an, up, uh, an upward trend for the next three years. Uh, thanks to long-term subscription. So that was all. Thank you very much. And if you have some questions, Diego and I, we are here. Thank, thank you very much, Ignacio. Uh, that was a very, very cool application. Uh, I really like it because it has potential for a lot of good social impact. I think I saw a raised hand over. Uh, Katja, can you pass the microphone, maybe? No. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. Um, I have a hard time. Uh, oh, I don't see him anyway. Uh, I have a hard time to understand, or uh, yeah, to understand the concept why there is a need for an insurance company when it's on the blockchain that you can just pool the money from the insurance payments and automatically pay them when these events happen. So I kind of have a hard time to understand why. Do I need someone to make profit from it when we can just do it on the blockchain directly as a contract? I'm not sure if I understood correctly the, the question. Uh, is the idea, uh, so the, the idea of the product that are, are sold and managed through the platform is uh, what's called a, a parametric microinsurances. So microinsurance means that it's a small insurance uh, managing a small product like the crops of the farmer, for example. The parametric part means that uh, the clauses uh, in the insurance are related to objective uh, parameters such as the wind that is measurable, does not require evaluation. So in that sense, whenever uh, uh, such a clause, such a, such a contract, a microinsurance micro is created and then triggered, so the wind goes higher than, than the limit, uh, the payment can be triggered. Then the payment could be uh, a payment, a traditional payment like a, like a sending money to a one bank account, but it could be also automatized to, to be paid with, uh, with other kind of cryptocurrencies or, or such. That is not uh, a restriction in, in our model. It could be done with either of them. Does it answer your question? Uh, so do you have still maybe a process where insurances check the claims and approve them or yeah 
I mean, I mean, in principle, the the idea is to to use uh, this system precisely with uh, with insurances that do not require checking of claims, uh, meaning uh, these parametric microinsurances. Uh, in cases where claims uh, uh, need to be checked by, by an expert or such, uh, and the system should be adapted so that uh, the insurance can then come and verify and authorize this tran transaction. But in these parametric microinsurances, even in the way they are managed now, uh, without the, this platform in insurance companies, this is not needed. There's no need for, uh, for verification by, by the insurance company. Uh, thank you. And we have also two questions on a Slido that are maybe related. So do the, uh, do the user create the smart contract with the, with the web interface? Could, also be, could, also, could it also be done with an API? And uh, how do they create the templates for microinsurance? Yes, I, I'm going so to... Yes, okay. please. Let me, let me as well. Uh, for the first question, uh, the, the platform uh, has the smart contracts deployed, so they are not uh, deployed by the user or, or by, by, by an API. So the, the platform, <coughs> the, the user uh, only uses the, the, the smart contracts that are deployed. Uh, this, this smart contracts uh, can handle uh, multiple uh, Micro, micro insurance. So uh, when when you need to create a new micro insurance, uh, you you just with the API or with the web platform, you just uh, use the platform to create a, a new one micro insurance. And what is the second question, please? Uh, the second question: uh, How do they create the template? Uh, the idea of create uh, templates is uh, for enterprise uh, for insurance templates so it's for, so for, for insurance uh, enterprise. So uh, this this user can create uh, uh, these templates that can be reused uh, by by the other other people in the platform who who, who want to sync uh, a contract uh, a new insurance. Okay. So Thanks. basically. Uh, uh, an insurance company creates uh, one template that then is specified for different users, different uh, clients, mm. and an agent will use it to create a customized. So I think maybe the question was how do how do the insurance companies create these templates? But I think we don't really. <laughs> it sounds a little bit technical, so maybe we don't have time to answer this question. Uh, yeah, it would be. But a I guess forum, you have documentation basically. for that. I assume. Yes. Well, thank you very much uh, to the both of you, and uh, let's move to the next presentation, which is MFSSIA. So we have Alex Norta on Zoom, I think. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, Hi, let Alex. me share. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very and good. Please share your screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, so can you see this? Yes. Right, and you see this too. I'm doing slideshow. You can see this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. And um, yeah, I will present today about uh, multi-factor self-sovereign identity authentication um, MFSSI. And before I get started, I uh, heard yesterday that uh, the acceptance rate of projects was around 10%. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's a well, honor and privilege that uh, we made it uh, into, into uh, <coughs> uh, being chosen. Uh, we have created um, for questions a little telegram channel, which you can see here, uh, this little blue bush link. And then here at the bottom, uh, we have compiled uh, on the website uh, for which you have here the link, um, further information um, about multi-factor self-sovereign identity authentication. So, and before I get started, I just want to mention that one of my team members, namely Vimal uh, Kumar Trivedi, um, uh, who was also my PhD student, uh, 
uh, Tau Tech uh, just defended his PhD thesis actually in a very ontogen related topic, which I will obviously not get into here, but it's also very much exactly about this merger of semantic web and blockchains. Um, so here you have the title, just for the record, I'm very proud um, to have him defend and also being part of this uh, team. Uh, so you can check this uh, if you want after the presentation is very interesting work okay <clears throat> okay let's move into mfssi so what challenges have we addressed um we are experiencing a rise in machine to everything economy uh we have published a little position paper about this which is also available open access and which we link to uh, actually here also here uh, on this website uh, we also see further um, um, that Web3 rises, DeFi, Oracles, DAOs, NFTs, and uh, they all need to be trusted um, and uh, have them to trust others. Yeah. So uh, we are really in need of trust establishment between systems, devices, organizations, and humans. And we can really infer that single sign-on identity authentication uh, is not suitable for, say, uh, complex machine to everything and to X uh, economies uh, or um, the other cases are listed below. Um, in the market, we have observed that fixed challenges uh, are available up to maximum of five uh, for identity authentication, which is not quite satisfactory. And uh, it's also not uh, necessarily context dependently uh, configurable. <clears throat> and also, internet, uh, sorry, uh, identity authentication is often controlled by governments, like say the Estonian ID cards. Uh, so um, there's then a risk to be limited, censored, or cancelled, or to have social credit scores assigned, and so on. So, self sovereign identity authentication is really essential, and with blockchain technologies. Uh, this is um, a good option. So just to show you a little bit conceptually, um, I mean, what is the idea? Maybe I start on the right hand side. <coughs> you have uh, going back to machine to everything to X economy, you have systems, devices, organizations and humans and the pose uh, challenges yeah, uh, that can be configured, say, from a marketplace. And then a counterparty that can also be systems, devices, organizations, or humans uh, need to then respond. Uh, both challenges and responses are stored in blockchains, and then um, the results are evaluated. So how are we doing this? I mean, just to show you what this could mean in a running case. And this is really taken from our own assignment uh, where we had to address uh, the connection of different types of blockchain systems, say Ethereum <coughs> and, and uh, Polygon. <coughs> um, so let's assume there's a marketplace where apples are traded uh, from a pharma corp to a grocery store and um, uh, a deal is made. Then um, let's assume um, all the semantics for this business deal is captured in a decentralized knowledge graph. And um, uh, so we've heard about the centralized knowledge graphs uh, in, in the morning. And uh, uh, then we analyze based on uh, challenges. For example, one challenge is um, we need to check if the consensus still exists with respect to the price. So for so many apples, say 10,000 uh, euros, or, or even, uh, I don't know, Satoshis were uh, assigned as a price. We then consider oracles <coughs> um, to uh, deliver um, the price uh, information, say, from the farm corp. So if this matches with the 10,000 units, uh, that is fine. But uh, for example, if the goes to a store chain, uh, oracle uh, delivers back um, uh, only 9,000 units uh, for uh, monetary units for compensation were assigned, then we obviously lack uh, consensus, yeah. But let's assume now <coughs> uh, we have a consensus, then we move to the next uh, step where uh, MFSSI is the next challenge, must check um, the security licenses um, for 
uh, both systems of the pharmacope and the grocery store chain using different blockchain systems. And here, once again, um, uh, these licenses are given in uh, semantically uh, as DKG instances. <clears throat> They're an analyzed. And then uh, um, it could be checked uh, if, if the accreditation is okay for the auditing company, um, if um, the uh, period of the security license is, is uh, good and so on. And then finally, at the very bottom, we have gateways in place. Um, uh, we have one company uh, or partner being Peronex doing this. And uh, again, uh, DKG instances could check um, if uh, these gateways have the right type of configuration and are in place in the first instance. And uh, so it's always really the same cycle, DKG instances. We have challenge sets also expressed in DKG instances, and um, we capture the responses um, uh, using oracles and then evaluate if there's a match. So <clears throat> this is basically uh, the same story that uh, I have explained before. So we have integrated with pre-existing um, uh, solutions uh, for our, uh, you could say, MVP. <clears throat> And here we have uh, the architecture. Um, so let's, ass let's assume Ethereum and Polygon must be checked if they can. Uh, I mean, through a set of challenges, uh, if they can uh, match to exchange uh, sensitive business transaction data. So we have here uh, employed um, uh, from IXEC uh, Oracle capability. Uh, we use uh, smart contracts for multi-factor authentications and uh, basically uh, the oracles from the evaluation. And um, then further on, um, we uh, use AWS uh, and EC2 Linux instances, uh, so Spring Boot, uh, REST app uh, for the TKG uh, validation. And uh, we use an Angular app for the challenge set marketplace. And uh, in the end, uh, we have JSON files that uh, capture um, the information about the business contract, the security licenses, and the gateway info. So um, basically matching with this little running case I've expressed uh, here conceptually uh, earlier. <clears throat> yeah, so here's once again the technology step few um, which I've uh, mentioned uh, earlier. Um, so uh, since uh, this is very much about trust on to chain, um, we would um, infer that uh, our project of multi-factor self-sovereign identity authentication is very much at the core of, of this project. And indeed, uh, I mean, we have now this MVP But um, there are uh, many integration options with other projects. So, for example, uh, we already heard about Atos, um, where also um, identity authentication of IoT devices along the life cycles uh, would be very good to have. Uh, I mean, once you connect uh, IoT devices in a peer to peer way, then of course you run into a trust issue. So, there, uh, MFSSI can be helpful. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, assorted NFT in projects like PySwap. So there they have the problem to understand the legitimacy of their NFTs. Um, again, a case for MFSSI. Then also the other way around, we can integrate other projects um, like Reputable um, to uh, employ reputation indicators into challenge uh, response evaluations. Um, then there's a good project like PSSDR SDA uh, to um, have GDPR compliant uh, private data uh, used in challenge responses. Then uh, additional Dart, uh, I mean, Oracle projects like Dart and Desmo LD. So at the moment, we use the IXEC uh, Oracles uh, for our evaluation. But um, certainly uh, uh, the MVP can be extended to integrate uh, oracles uh, with additional 
um, specific uh, Oracle capabilities. <coughs> um, DW uh, marking is very interesting to integrate also with uh, to prevent dishonest data sellers and malicious buyers. Yeah, so this is also something which uh, would be very interested is interesting for us for challenge and response uh, integration geontology uh, to determine geographic uh, data sources. Yeah, also um, a very good candidate uh, to adopt into challenges. Solid uh, ferry to verify credential and tenacious um, uh, for trustworthy semantics aware interoperable cloud services. So we have uh, beyond uh, our current MVP, um, excellent integration options, and also um, in FSSI heads itself very much for uh, future applications for core three. Um, for example, um, uh, we, we pitched ourselves uh, with a suggestion for uh, censorship resistant and uh, market uh, uh, model restoring um, uh, social media platform. Uh, but uh, we believe uh, beyond that, that certainly MFSSI uh, could be a core element uh, to establish trust uh, also in the upcoming core three. Um, um uh, projects uh, three minutes yes so i'm almost done so what are the benefits with mfssi so mfssi is essentially a flexibly configurable and scalable fact checker system you could say and the blockchains uh, we integrate uh, allow for immutable provenance tracking of events um, we have uh, integrated uh, the the foundation for a challenge set marketplace. Um, it's a bit allegorically comparable to an app store for apps, but we have a challenge set store that we have on our minds um, to then uh, configure their challenges depending on contexts that need to be responded to and evaluated. Uh, so the responses are evaluated with oracles, uh, potentially of diverse types. At the moment, as I said, we use the iExec oracles um, we have multi-purpose trust establishment solutions having in mind uh, this uh, framework of a machine to everything economy and to X economy where systems, devices, organizations and humans uh, need to establish trust uh, with each other uh, beyond single sign-on. And uh, so indeed we then have automated trust management. Um, um, it's away from um, that, uh, that, that goes beyond expensive and slow uh, bureaucracy or bureaucrats who take care of this typically. And uh, as I said, we are also extensible with many other on-to-chain projects, but uh, beyond that uh, also offer ourselves um, as an integral part for hopefully the core three projects. And this way, uh, uh, given that trust management is typically is something that uh, build bureaucrats do yeah? uh, in human driven qualitative organizations. Um, we potentially save enormously time and costs. So for example, for intercontinental uh, B2B transactions, such as with large scale, say Alibaba purchases, uh, where it's very difficult to understand how can you trust your counterpart. So we have the resources uh, of uh, MFSSI. So there's a little demonstration video that we compiled. Then we have the source code available and also here the installation instructions. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. That was very interesting. And uh, I think your project is a very good <laughs> example of uh, what kind of services on the chain can provide to applications. So I hope this will inspire uh, applicants for the next open call. I don't know if you have questions. Mm -hmm. I think we don't have questions on, s we have a question in the audience. <laughs> uh, hello, yes, thanks. Um, could you explain how um, the system works as a scalable fact checker or just as a fact checker? I think I, think I missed that. <coughs> yes, I mean, um, uh, so, so the idea is that uh, we, put in place the seed for a marketplace yeah, of challenge sets. 
so kind of the vision is that uh, you have uh, security experts, consultants who then create challenges and they can then be configured uh, uh, in arbitrary numbers depending on the context. For example, if you have a scenario where uh, you want to have a challenge response evaluation lifecycle for say IoT systems, the challenge sets would be very different uh, versus let's say um, for an e-healthcare case. If uh, different clinics uh, uh, want to um, exchange sensitive healthcare data uh, about a patient um, in, a, in a personalized healthcare um, way. Yeah, uh, this again would require very different challenge sets, um, and in that sense, uh, we we plan to have uh, well uh, scalability uh, depending on on the application context. Thank you. So there's, a, there's still a lot of work in future to do. Um, this is, let's say, an, an, an MVP. Uh, it's a short project, uh, but we're looking forward to um, extend on the foundation we could lay here in, in this project now. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Thank you for, uh, for the question. And now we can move on to Bowler. So the speaker will be Willem Jan van den Heuvel. I hope I said it correctly. Good luck with English, Frank. Here's the microphone. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. So uh, thanks again for uh, having us invited during today's event. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I'm not only alluding, in fact, to the people here inside, but also the people online, because what I've understood is a lot of people watching us, so thank you also for being with us. Also, before I start with presenting today's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, pitch uh, on Bowler, and in particular what I will zoom on is uh, on uh, the rationale behind Bowler and why Bowler could be an interesting tool for you to pick up. Before I do that, I would like to thank, uh, um, and uh, on behalf of the entire Bowler team, uh, the, both of the Charamelas, uh, Alberto and Marco, and of course also Vlado who has been uh, there now and then to help us out and give us uh, good advice along the way. So uh, this uh, Bowler project has been a project uh, in fact which has uh, been, uh, been running in uh, the second round and it uh, has been a short uh, uh, run uh, project just for your information. In fact, the Bowler has been developed, uh, conceived, deployed uh, by a team and this team uh, comprises of AstraCode. And AstraCode is, as you can, he uh, can hear maybe, it's an, it's an Italian company from Pescare. Um, and uh, we have been working with uh, AstraCode uh, from the perspective of the divisor. So in fact, uh, um, I'm working part-time for divisor and part-time I'm also a university professor. Uh, having said all of that, I hope uh, you understand uh, then also the setup of today's talk. Um, so what we try to do with the Bowler is we try to address a couple of challenges which were aligned with the challenges of Omto Chain, right? So and what we have done is we have listed here the five key uh, challenges that we wanted to address to some extent, right? Again, we have been a short run project, so we try to realize and I guess address these uh, issues. Um, but uh, some more work is, is needed for sure in the future. So first of all, a lot of the tools, also a lot of the tools presented here, they implicitly or explicitly assume you are well versed in blockchain. You understand blockchain technology and you can program them, right? This is not true in reality. So if you go out in reality, there's a lot of programmers out there, enterprise programmers who have little or almost no knowledge about uh, blockchain. So um, and uh, in particular also about smart contracts that of course are in themselves uh, for non-experts pretty hard to design in such a way that they are also correct and complete. So secondly, the domain knowledge that's captured in the uh, contracts is typically hardwired. So it's very uh, difficult to change the domain knowledge, to, uh, to change policies, for example, with respect to law legislations or business policies once you have established your smart contract. Thirdly, also what happens is that um, 
current smart contract languages, and we have focused, uh, by the way, on Solidity, on Ethereum, they have uh, very little capacity to actually capture domain semantics. So typically, they do capture operational semantics, they do capture program level uh, semantics, but what we have tried to do in the bowler is lift somehow the level of semantics and let's say establish a bridge between the programming solidity code at the one end side and the reality in which companies live in terms of business processes and business applications they have to develop at the other end side. And the bowler has been a first effort in fact to do it. And uh, the fourth challenge that we wanted to uh, address is that a lot of uh, smart contract developers, they suffer from something which is uh, out there already for a long time in the software industry, which is called the not invented here syndrome, okay? So typically what they do, they start from scratch because typically they think I can do a better job than the guy before me, okay? Which in many, many cases in fact is not true. And this is a waste because it limits and it hinders reuse of a uh, programming code. And this, uh, in again, is an issue that we wanted to pick up with the bower, and we wanted to somehow address it in first step. And uh, fifthly, also, it's pretty hard to deploy, or, and also redeploy in multi-cloud environments. And uh, in fact, also to uh, uh, get practices uh, in smart contract develop fully aligned with modern day uh, approaches like DevOps and MLOps. Uh, for sure, uh, we wanted to address a, a lot of these issues and challenges, but we couldn't do it all, especially not in the six months that we have had, in the six months in which this divisor company worked together with Astra Code. And in fact, we started from the Astra Code baseline. They already had a tool, a low code, uh, let's say IDE tool to their, uh, uh, um, in, their, in their product range that we used as a starting point to build on uh, the Bowler tool, and uh, in which we wanted as a divisor company to combine, let's say, uh, uh, our clientele and our products and also scientific knowledge with, uh, with, the, uh, with the baseline that I've just uh, pointed out. So what we have tried to do with the Bowler, and uh, I've tried to uh, graphically illustrate this at the right hand side, is we try to address the layers of the onto-chain stack that by now you should be well aware of. And of course, uh, what we have been trying to do is um, build on top of the baseline of our struct code and to develop a visual modeling environment. And the key idea behind this uh, visual modeling environment is, point one, it should be low code. Point two, of course, it should be uh, able to assemble smart contracts by putting together visual components, visual elements, right? For example, visual elements for functions, for events, for triggers, and map them down into the Solidity uh, code. So also what we wanted to do is to develop Bowler blueprints. So these are templates, uh, they can indeed be parameterized, and they can be picked up by non-experts. So the idea is, we at the one hand side, the Bowler caters for the needs of people who do have deep knowledge of smart contract coding, they would develop, let's say, templates, which they would make available to, let's say, non-experts, uh, non right? So, and uh, enterprise application engineers. So, and uh, in particular, um, what we have tried to do is we tried to zoom in on uh, a specific type of blueprints, and in particular on those blueprints, which would cater for the development of NFTs, and uh, even to be more specific, we have been zooming in on NFT tickets for reasons of scoping and time, because simply we, we couldn't do more in the time given to us. So bear in mind, this is six months. Now, as you may remember from the previous slide, we also wanted to do something with this bridge, right, that, that we have included on the previous slide. So we wanted to bridge the operational semantics of smart contracts with the more, let's say, the business process semantics in the enterprise application. So that's what we try to do. And therefore, we had to lift the level of semantics. And what we try to do in the Bowler is to allow, let's say, to uh, annotate the uh, smart contracts with uh, OWL, OWL2 kind of descriptions in order to better be able to capture business semantics, okay? 
and uh, more faithfully, let's say, uh, implement and reflect more uh, isomorphically, if you wish, the enterprise uh, application concepts into the Solidity code. Uh, and uh, to be very honest, we, we managed to do it, but again, we had to scope. We had to be very careful in what we could do, because again, time was limited. And we wanted to try out things in practice, okay? So um, let me move on. I'm spending too much time on this one. And uh, of course, all of this should be done in a realistic manner in the sense that these visual modeling components should be able to be mapped down to the level of, let's say, solidity and uh, be deployed on Ethereum. So this is what we try to do. Now, what are the main features of the Bowler? And I hope you get interested in the Bowler after this presentation. So I will not deeply go into the key architectural elements. I won't tell too much about the implementation constructs, but I hope that after this presentation, you will reach out to us and start studying the project a little bit more in detail. Uh, what I've done here is I've listed the two key features of the Bowler, which is the visu visual modeling environment. Indeed, it has this low code uh, assembly factory. So the idea is you assemble contracts by visually combining various modeling elements. And also in this visual modeling uh, environment, you are able to add some semantics, right? And you do this in, 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 in the IDE and in the back, everything is translated down into REF OWL and automatically mapped down at the uh, end of the day in the solidity. So, and in particular uh, for that, to, uh, to, uh, to enable that, we have used uh, the blueprints and to do some limited semantic reasoning. So in the beginning of the project, what we wanted to do is go for the full-fledged reasoning. For example, could we somehow compose uh, uh, various elements in uh, and various uh, uh, um, uh, contracts? Could we somehow do it or decompose them? I mean, these types of operations. So at the end of the day, what we managed to do in this Bowler project is to exploit semantics in order to do, for example, uh, matchmaking between the enterprise needs and the blueprints available in the blueprint repository. But uh, of course, uh, in principle, we have laid the foundation in this project to do much more. But we simply lack now the time um, to, uh, to, to do things like automatic uh, and, uh, or, or semi-automatic uh, composition and decomposition, for example, of the contracts. Um, so how does it look like? Um, it looks like this. At the left-hand top, uh, left-hand side, you can see the IDE, uh, the graphical uh, user interface that is being used. Uh, indeed, you still need to do a little bit of coding, uh, but we try to minimize it. Uh, then there's a code generator. It spits out the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, associated solidity code and also there is a little bit of semantic reasoning like I tried to explain to you to uh, assert semantically for blueprints in the blueprint repository and yes we also have developed some blueprints for this NFT ticketing domain as a first step as a demonstrator to show the capacities uh, that the bowler in principle has. Um, now uh, uh, there is yes there's also a demo of the bowler this is a five minute or seven minute, I believe, uh, video, which I will not show to you. Uh, please uh, look at it at home and it shows to you step by step uh, how you can indeed graphically do uh, the, uh, the composition of the models and you can map them down in solidity and how you can use the semantic engine underpinning the Bowler. Um, let me skip this, this slide and then try to tease a little bit your interest even more, I hope at least, in this uh, product. So what we have been doing is we have not only been developing stuff, but also testing it out in practice. We have done it at one of the largest festivals in the Netherlands, which is called Passpop, took place a couple of weeks ago. And uh, in fact, what we did do there is two things. At the one side, we have presented the baller to an audience of about 70 interested festival organizers uh, and uh, also a venture capitalist and also, and in addition, uh, uh, organizations who represent, uh, in fact, uh, artists, right? Because there's a lot of traction uh, with respect uh, to NFTs in the music industry, and they are seeking for new business models, and we hope, and, and what we try to pitch there is to use the Bowler as a vehicle to venture out and find new ways to exploit the power of NFTs in all types of business revolving around uh, festivals. But also what we did do is we developed the NFT ticketing, and we did, we did do a bit of experimentation with that uh, on-premise. Um, so, um, 
So let me show maybe a little bit more about it. We what we have done is we also made a video. And let me see if I can get it working. You never know. It should have been here. Last time I saw it was here. Uh, okay. Okay, then I will. Now my German is a little bit less developed. Kopieren. And then I guess I can put it in. Einfügen. And then it sh oh, it should work. Oh, I have only to log in again. Okay, give me one second. One second. By the way, on this video we'll see our friends from Astrakhod. We are here in Netherlands at Pascal Festival. Uh, we are here to present our latest product. Uh, it's a smart contract visual ID. So, what are we actually doing here now? With the with the smart contract ID, we built an NFT ticketing marketplace for the festival, where people can buy tickets through the NFT. Basically, each ticket will be digitally represented by an NFT that is unique and has also inside information that is valuable, will be valuable also after the festival. So for instance, you can put in something like uh, a little memory or like a special video or even a special song or whatever you prepare, a souvenir. And this is something that in the future will allow festival organizers to enlarge their offering and basically have not only a, a physical offering but also a digital offering because of course now with the physical and digital world are more and more intertwined and so it really puts pressure on organizers to give more and more also on the digital aspect of, uh, of things and also on the after of the festival and um, so we believe that this could be in the future something really cool and uh, we hope that when it will be out in I think uh, about two months everybody will come and try it. Uh, smart contract visual, visual ID will be available in a few months for the user of the community. So stay in touch, keep following us. Okay, I will wrap it up now. So, uh, so what we have done during the past six months is uh, we have built on top of the existing offering of Astra Code a, a new offering which allows uh, non-experts in uh, smart contracting to device uh, smart contracts in a, gra in a graphical way, add and annotate these contracts with some, let's say at this time maybe limited, but to add some semantics and map them down into Solidity. Uh, we have done this in an iterative way and what we have, we tried things out in practice to the, to the best of our possibilities. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. My email address is mentioned here. Uh, the idea is to launch uh, the project uh, at the website of Astra Code and this will be done uh, at the beginning of next month and uh, stay tuned and keep following us hopefully at uh, the mentioned website. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know we have time for maybe one question. We are running a bit late.
Thank you for your presentation. <coughs> I want to ask you, um, I mean, you had a very interesting slide uh, that shows the ID, if we can go to, to that. Of course, the zooming, uh, uh, the resolution here doesn't help very much, but uh, as far as I can understand, there are some building blocks for uh, kind of a semantic uh, programming uh, by means of uh, just picking up some boxes and building uh, your, uh, your, your program uh, some kind of graphically without writing too much code. So um, do you also include in these uh, boxes uh, existing uh, software solutions provided in the on chain ecosystem? Uh, a very good question, thank you very much. Um, um, yes and no. Uh, indeed, uh, what we uh, are doing right now is we are reusing existing models, and this is done through the Bowler blueprints. Uh, thus far, we have been focusing on the, uh, NF the ticketing NFTs that we have developed uh, ourselves for the purpose of this festival. Uh, uh, and no, uh, we have not yet done that for the larger on-chain community, but definitely there is a lot of options and there's a lot of leadway, if you wish, for other organizations within, within on-chain to start using, let's say, the Bowler tool uh, in order uh, to do, let's say, develop these smart contracts, but also, more importantly, make them reusable and readily available for other members in the on-chain uh, ecosystem. Sorry, if I may follow this up. Uh, are you going to be able to help you with your solution, the developers of uh, OC3 projects? Yeah, that is a very uh, interesting question. Uh, that would indeed uh, be our, uh, let's say, dream. It would also be a very nice way to further uh, and even further uh, uh, realize th the rest of the, uh, of the bowler that we couldn't do. For example, the automatic testing, which we wanted to do. But for sure, we are very much eager and willing to help out other partners in the Entertain uh, 3, uh, let's say, edition uh, in the development. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again. And now we can move to Onto Space. Uh, we should have Marek online. Marek? Marek. Hello, everybody. Please go ahead. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very sorry I couldn't be with you for all the conference, but it's extremely uh, busy time for me about blockchains, about actually quantum blockchains uh, and many, many other developments uh, in that space. But uh, we are today uh, three people, so it's unusual a presentation in a bit because we will be speaking uh, in three. I will make a only short introduction. Uh, uh, when I started this project uh, with you, I was, uh, you know, doing much more things, but now I have absolutely wonderful uh, project management with Tomas and development with Dominic and other teams. And let me only say a few words. I also had uh, the big pleasure to say this. So first and foremost, um, our project, uh, uh, which we called Onto Space, uh, is actually completely equal. It's equivalent to a kind of the synergy between semantic and blockchain technologies. And uh, the overall aim was to build knowledge representation systems that we can trust. Uh, Thomas, you can advance the slide. Um, uh, so basically, uh, the fundamental question we need to ask, and we ask ourselves a long time ago, why do we want to marry blockchain and ontology? And first and foremost, uh, we wanted to empower semantic data in general, and ontologies in particular, in particular knowledge graphs with trust. We wanted to enable data integrity and all these features of blockchain that are known here. I don't want to go into these. Perhaps non reputation and high availability is the most important, and that they apply to knowledge representation systems. And then uh, we want a truly decentralized system for knowledge dissemination for obvious reasons. I mean, knowledge should be decentralized. If it is centralized, that it becomes autocratic. Okay, and we have many examples of where it can go. This, in this world, so we wanted this truly decentralized uh, scenario. And finally, uh, last but not least, in, in, in fact, uh, we wanted these ingenious inventions of blockchain space like NFTs uh, to contribute to knowledge representation for obvious reasons. They are absolutely excellent for you know, adding additional value to 
this precious thing which is knowledge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we ask ourselves a long time ago how to do it. And actually, we have, I mean, in general, we can have a three kinds of approaches. Uh, there is uh, one approach where you embed knowledge graphs, ontologies, whatever, into blockchain. And that's what uh, is, uh, of course, possible, but uh, that has a lot of uh, different uh, drawbacks. Or you can actually go to fully off-chain solution and still maintain the situation that blockchain is highly connected uh, to, to these pieces of knowledge, uh, sitting on other infrastructure, not really integrated. And we didn't want that. We wanted something that uh, uh, is like a mix of these two concepts. And we invented quite a time ago the concept of graph chain. And we proposed that in this uh, whole structure of uh, onto chain uh, project. Uh, and we are very happy that you accepted our, our vision. So that's how uh, our concept was born, like this. <coughs> Basically, uh, in a very, very general idea, uh, to summarize, uh, graph chain and then onto space uh, is a linked chain of named RDF graphs. Uh, of course, they can be and are additionally specified by graph chain, specific graph chain ontology. We have a sort of unique cryptographic algorithms for calculating digests of the named graphs. And we even recently uh, submitted another paper specifically devoted to that with high level cryptography uh, and then uh, proving that it works. And we have, of course, the set of blockchain network mechanisms that are doing the rest. We used a few new mechanisms for obvious reasons. And guys, that's everything I wanted to say. I am very happy I participated in the project. Now I uh, give the stage to uh, Tomasz. Uh, Tomasz, please go ahead with the rest of our presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Mirek. Uh, well, we like to think of OntoSpace as a new solution based on graph chain, but still uh, it's much more advanced and gives uh, much more possibilities. Well, in creating OntoSpace, a huge step in the development of graph chain technology, well, we faced several challenges. Uh, the main was storing graph data while securing it with the blockchain technology. Uh, another important challenge was uh, to be able to create a, a blockchain ecosystem. In the case of creating a solution capable of meeting these challenges, uh, we modified the Ethereum client. We've chosen the Bezu client for the modifications. And we also introduced a new cryptographic hashing algorithm. Uh, also, we used MetaMask for the authentication process and introduced a tethering mechanism. So by default, uh, Ethereum clients do not support direct reading from external data sources. Uh, so we solved this problem by modifying uh, the return opcode uh, while not interfering with the Ethereum specification. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the hashing algorithm, the interwoven hash of vicious circle free graph, uh, is our answer to proper digest calculation in as many cases uh, as possible. And additionally, it, um, it's, it grants the safety and uh, is fully com uh, compatible uh, with the article published uh, in IAAA uh, that, we, that our team uh, is author of. Uh, you can find this article on our, on our website, graphtrain.io slash IEEE. Um, also, uh, well, as said before, the authentication process is very important, uh, especially in terms of user experience. Uh, well, and that's why we decided to implement MetaMask as a solution that is well known, secure, easy to use, and at the same time uh, guarantees uh, the con control over access to the functionalities we want to offer. Um, the tethering mechanism uh, that was introduced uh, allows uh, for easy connection to the parent chain and uh, simultaneous existence in the ecosystem of multiple blockchains. Well, uh, an important aspect of this solution is that it's um, easy to implement. Um, and now Dominic will tell you more about the solution and some technical aspects. Hello. I will shortly describe the building blocks of our solution. Onto node featured on the right consists of four main parts. Onto shell is the point of contact for end users. It serves as the API endpoint and for REST requests and as server side for web user interface. Uh, behind onto shell are three main parts of the node. Onto pod, which is a triple store database, in our case, base graph. 
blockchain node, which was Bezos, as Thomas mentioned, uh, and synchronization with a component uh, written in Java and responsible for keeping on top of the blockchain nodes in sync. A network of onto nodes is a graph chain or onto side chain in general. There could be also different side chains made with different technologies for other purposes, all working together in an ecosystem we call onto space. How graph chain synchronization works. The process starts in the middle lane on the right side with end user publishing a graph through our API in our shell. The hash of the graph is calculated and the graph is inserted uh, into the triple store. After that, smart contract method is executed, which stores graph metadata, including hash of the graph on the blockchain. Next, blockchain data is distributed across the network through normal blockchain mechanisms. In other notes, after a new blockchain transaction arrives, synchronization software retrieves the new graph metadata from smart contract and requests the graph itself from other nodes. After checking that uh, the hash of received graph is the same as the one on the blockchain, uh, graph is inserted into local triple star, which ends synchronization process. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Uh, so as we've already said, we have successfully finished call one, providing technology on the proof of concept level. Uh, and I'd like to show you what is beyond this state and how onto space can be an important component and part of onto chain ecosystem. Well, the final outcome um, of uh, this call two uh, is an uh, ecosystem that is stable, scalable, efficient, and creates a cost-effective network. Well, as it's always easier to understand the idea and concept supported by technology using use cases. So one of currently live implementation of the previous version of the uh, technology is layi.info, which is a legal entity identifier solution. And thanks to the use of graph chain version one, there's a real possibility of reliable, reliable verification of the legality of companies entities. And currently, lei.info supports more than uh, 2 million entries. And when we just consider potential usage of onto space, this number might increase uh, tens of times over uh, if and when the technology is uh, implemented. And as every technology is made to be used for specific application, onto space has a wide range of possible uses. Uh, I would like to name some of them. The first one is a side chain as a separate entity. And well, as strange as it might sound, we can call it out of the box solution for your graph data storage needs. Uh, well, why you need graph data? Well, in many cases, it's just, uh, it might be faster than standard ways of storing data. So it's perfect solution, both for small amounts of company data or large sets of uh, many um, complicated connections and internal relations. Uh, and it's all secured with the blessing of blockchain inside onto space. Uh, the second use case is intellectual property rights and limited use of ecosystem resources. Uh, well, the problem we see uh, is that there is a need for a limiting number of times a resource can be accessed. And by resource, I think of data or a set of data. Going one step forward, we also can provide exact information about owner of the data set and if needed, his personal data, uh, which might be very uh, important regarding intellectual property. Uh, well, that's interesting topic, the intellectual property rights, uh, maybe not as NFT, but stored internally with history and detailed information. Well, and it's uh, all accessed and identified with the use of onto space. Um, the third use case uh, is a support for different processes based on created side chains. Uh, well, nothing is limitless, but we are trying to get close to it. For now, we use graph consisting of many millions of triples. Uh, well, and this number is only going to grow. Uh, and as far as it gets, scalability gets easier with every new sidechain created for specific purpose, which works independently from other sidechains. So um, at the end, you can grow your network if only needs uh, occurs. And now I'd like to show you a quick demonstration um, of, um, of our solution. It can also work headless. Um, well, in here we have a network containing uh, first node um, and the second node. They're on different machines with different IP addresses. 
And um, as said before, we use MetaMask um, for the authentication process. Um, the Spark UL editor as our um, test tool. Um, we'll need to log into. I, the I think there's something wrong with your screen. Oh, sorry. sorry there's sorry, something sorry. wrong with your screen. I... What is oh, wrong? Can you see normal? it? Okay, maybe it's normal. Oh. Sorry. Oh yeah, it is normal, but it's uh, recording from the Oculus, I think, you know, uh, from the Oculus Quest. So that's, uh, that's why it looks like this. Um, so uh, we need to connect um, as a, with a role of a node. Mm, login process uh, must be done for all the nodes. Now we use the private key that is obtained during the deployment process. Uh, it's all in the readme file in our repository. And now we check uh, how many records are in the database. We have 17. Also, we have 17 uh, records in the, uh, in the second node. Yeah, as you can see, both have 17. Now we go uh, to the upload. We can use a couple of formats. We'll use total format, uh, as mentioned before, with the role of a node. Uh, we type in the URI and choose the file we want to upload. Uh, after the upload is done, which will take uh, some time, um, all the processes uh, will start and the synchronization process will start uh, as well. <coughs> okay, so uh, just a little bit more and yeah. Um, now the graph is uploaded from node one. Uh, now we'll go to the second node uh, and, and we'll check uh, with the download option if it's already there. We type in the URI uh, and try to search for it. And as you can see, it's already there, which means that the synchronization process uh, is completed. We have the version number one. Now from the second node, we'll try to upload another version that, mm, with the same URI, but it can have a changed file, for example, change graph graph and now I will skip a bit forward. Yep, it is already uploaded. And we go to the first node to see uh, if the synchronization process uh, is completed. We type in the URI, we find, uh, click find, and then you can see that there are two versions. The first version is the previous version and the second version is the current version of the file downloaded from, uh, from another node. And basically, that concludes uh, our presentation. Uh, all the necessary information are in our repository um, git, uh, at the GitHub, the on chain GitHub, also on our website. Um, and um, so thank you. And uh, we hope Call Free Project will make good use of Onto Space and graph chain technology. Thank you, Mirek. Uh, let me just quickly check Slido to see if we have questions. Or question in the in the room? No. Um, maybe one question from me. Um, do you have an idea of uh, what will be your um, your first or maybe next use case, uh, like end applications? Because uh, what you're providing again is a very essential building blocks for applications. Can you give us a feeling of uh, what what's coming? Well, uh, we were uh, contemplating a number of them, uh, and one of the applications that we uh, uh, offered, literally offered, and this process is still ongoing, is for supply chain management, okay? And that was actually in the context of the <coughs> agriculture. And why that? Because what happened, maybe you know, maybe don't, but uh, paradoxically, an uh, area of the uh, food representation in digital space is actually quite good representation in the semantic way and uh, using ontologies. So uh, we uh, built some concept on that and we, we offered something like that already. Uh, but also, uh, which is extremely interesting for us is that um, we are working uh, for a long time uh, with a big organization on data in the United States. It's called DBMC, the Data Management Council. And, uh, and they actually built ontologies and knowledge graphs. And recently they opened uh, a special working group on blockchains in that space and already invited us uh, to present uh, graph chain and onto space and the whole 
whole idea. And at this moment, I cannot uh, directly point, pinpoint which use case it could be, uh, but having in mind that we're speaking with one of the largest organization uh, that builds knowledge graph awareness in the United States and uh, uh, works with uh, clients like uh, NIST, like uh, uh, big banks and uh, pharma companies, uh, I'm sure uh, something will uh, arise from that, which probably will be, again, a connection between knowledge reputation uh, and, uh, and, and blockchain. Very straightforward work. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mirek, for your presentation. And now we can welcome the last speaker, Andreas Hoffman from uh, PySwap. Ah, here you are. Andreas, you have the floor. So, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation and uh, nice to be here. And um, yeah, my name is Andreas. I'm a co-founder of uh, PySwap. It's maybe it's a bit too, um, the picture's too big, but okay, we'll find the, the, there's something missing in the bottom. Um, oh, here he's there, yeah. So my name is Andreas Hoffmann. I'm co-founder of PySwap and uh, it's a totally new EVM agnostic uh, layer one protocol for prediction uh, predicting markets. Um, uh, I will tell you or I will present the possibilities with that protocol uh, referring on the biggest hype in the last uh, few years, uh, the NFT and the <coughs> markets that have been uh, growing up there like uh, OpenSea, Rarible and all the others. And uh, before I start with that, I want to uh, tell you something about me and my person, my background. So in my Analog life. I'm Andreas Hofmann. I have more than 25 years of uh, Markcom business communication now uh, in a, with a focus on structured finance. And um, in my digital life, I'm Andreas Hofmann.eth. I'm an OG in crypto. Um, OG, old guy or original gangster. I would prefer the old guy due to my hair. Uh, old guy also because uh, I have read the Satoshi paper I think quite early in the early 2012 I guess I have been customer the infamous uh, Mount Gox uh, cust uh, uh, exchange and have seen the Ethereum rising in 2015 and the, uh, the hack in 2016 so I'm quite a lot time in here and uh, but I'm read only. I am not a coder. Uh, I can read smart contracts. I do understand them partially, but I can't write them. So to dive into the NFT market, I would start with some numbers first. Uh, you all have heard about the uh, Beeple's NFT. I guess you've heard about it. Last year it was sold for 69, mil uh, 69 million euros or dollars in March 21. Uh, that was a totally unknown artist, and uh, it's a purely digital artist, uh, Mike Winkleman. Um, he also sold the 3D sculpture in the same year for another 29 million uh, in October. It was a 3D sculpture. Um, we have some other nice uh, examples, like the snapshot girl that was a or disaster girl. It was a, a, a meme that uh, was used from, uh, from 2005 on. Uh, for various disaster uh, scenarios, always this little girl in front in the background changed all the time. So it was just a meme. And it was uh, uh, tokenized in the end and was sold for 401,000. You might know the CryptoPunks. These are quite famous. They are the first one or some of the first ones. Uh, CryptoKitties have been uh, uh, in front, I guess. Um, it was sold in, uh, uh, in March for uh, almost 12 million. So these are um, quite a, a expensive NFTs. We have another meme, the Charlie bit me. That's also just for a meme for, for getting a surprise or uh, um, like the, the overly attached girlfriend that was a meme too. Um, was sold for $417,000. It's just for a meme for being uh, very engaged in something special. Huh? So, and we all are asking ourselves, uh, how, is, how do these prices, uh, are, are they, these prices okay? 
I mean, the, the most uh, or the, the, the biggest uh, uh, story in that, th I think, uh, was the Jack Dorsey tweet. He sold it last year for 2.9 million. And the guy who sold, uh, bought it, Zina Estehavi, uh, he wanted to sell it for another 48 million quite a year later. And he did an auction and he got a, the highest bid was 280 bucks. So we all ask ourselves, are the prices, are they valid or how do they uh, uh, come up? So what's the real problem with the NFT? So if I ask you, what are your biggest pain in the ass? I would say it's the uncertainty of the evalu evaluation in the end. Because the main challenge is uh, the uncertainty of, and to know if the, if the NFT is worth 48 million or 280. Why is it a problem? Because we have asymmetric markets. And the primary markets, you only have one or two uh, assets that are very high, in a very high price. So you have one Beeple, one pack or whatever. Uh, sorry, that was the, the part to illiquidity. illiquidity. Uh, the asymmetric markets, we only have one uh, uh, NFT. So um, you can, you can um, be interested, but if you don't have the 69 millions in your pockets, you won't, you won't be able to, to buy it. Um, on the secondary markets, it's quite hard to, to connect the um, uh, buyers and the sellers. We have a lot of illiquidity and the primary markets, um, as, as, as I said, we only have one Beeples and one pack. Um, the people want to invest, but they are not able to do. Then we have the uncertain value in the primary market. We've seen the Jack Dorsey tweet was about 2.9 million, but we also have a lot of wash trades on, on that uh, platform. So we have a lot of fakes and plagiarism, plagiarisms. We have a, on the secondary market, we are, it's a quite in transparent price building. It's so easy to manipulate. I mean, I only have to sell my uh, CryptoPunk to, to another wallet I own. I double the price and I sell it to another one I own. So we have three times uh, doubling price. Nobody knows if this is real, uh, the real value. OpenSea claimed itself 80% of the NFTs that were minted. So the primary market, that's the primary market. Uh, they are scams in the end. So how does the NFT evaluation work basically, you know, or how does it work for, for traditional shares? Because we, we all know the shares and they all have prices. Well, I would say that's quite easy because we have exchanges. We have exchanges in Europe, in Asia, in the US. Um, uh, t to the, uh, take the uh, example with Tesla, we have about 1 billion Tesla shares outstanding. And uh, they all get traded against 750 bucks a share. So it's quite easy. What the price of Bitcoin? It's almost the same. We have about 19 million BTC right now outstanding. We have exchanges like Binance and Kraken or Bitcoin DE or whatever. And they all trade the same BTC against 30,000 bucks above, right? Fair price of Ether, the same. We have 120 million Ether. We have uh, exchanges, the same exchanges, and we have uh, a fair price of right now, I think 2,000. So it's based on fiat in the end. Fiat is money, real money, dollar, euro, or whatever. All the altcoins, they are traded against ETH or against BTC. And in the background, we have the dollar. They are not traded on uh, the normal exchanges. They are traded on the DEX, on the decentralized exchanges. So you just take your Dash and swap it against ADA or against ETH or whatever. And in the end, the price will be coming uh, uh, from the dollar side in the end. So it's also based on fiat. But the fair price of NFTs, there are no exchanges. We don't have any exchange. We only have marketplaces for that. And we have only one NFT and the, we don't know how, wh how this price would be uh, fairly valued in the end. This is a nice uh, question because uh, the guy, Michael Spitz, he's from 360X, uh, he was talking about the problem of a two-sided asset or two-sided valuation of a one-sided asset. Uh, is it possible to get the sound? Sorry. If I, if I play. Uh, Having an NFT with market making. Explain to me how someone is going to make a market in an NFT. I just don't understand. You know, I come from a trading background. That's my background. So how do you make a two-way price on something that only exists once? 
And Luther, if, if you want to, otherwise, I think a good point to summarize is to go back to the idea that we... So they stopped it. They didn't know any answer on that. <laughs> so the pricing problems, uh, Maria says, uh, Maria is a, a Twitter guy. He says the pricing problems, that most of the entities do not have enough liquidity. And of course, we don't, don't have any financial derivatives on top of it. And without any derivatives, you won't find a fair price. So good news for Maria is we have it, the solution, because PySwap is, is addressing all these uh, concerns. And uh, with PySwap, you are able to predict the markets, any market. In the, in the end, we focus the NFT market right now, but it's also possible to predict the prices of CO2 certificates or of whatever. I will uh, name some, some examples later. So what is PySwap? PySwap is a kind of a decentralized, decentralized autonomous market maker mechanism. And we, uh, our value proposition is we increase the transparency. Transparency by providing a, uh, an ongoing price history for the uh, NFT. We increase the completeness because you can uh, add any NFT to the market or you can trade any NFT you want to. And we increase the access and participation because everybody is able to do that. Just You just need to do, uh, what you need to do is uh, you need the smart contract address and the ID of it. So PySwap is solving the NFT pricing dilemma by offering a perpetual synthetic NFT swap market we are able to predict the floor prices for 10K collections, for example. The good thing is you don't need to own the NFT, you just trade on it. Because if you buy a long or short certificate on the, on the exchange, you don't buy the underlying asset, you just buy the derivative. So you don't need to own the NFT to trade on it. We have a variable incentivizing fee structure for the liquidity providers. The uh, results are community-led market sentiments in the end, and uh, by that you have an infinite valuation, of course. What I like most is the rebase function for lending assets, because uh, NFTs have been not, uh, you haven't, you, could, you weren't able to use them as, as uh, lending assets, because nobody was, uh, no, knew how much the, the value is in the end, and uh, by, by NFT you get an ongoing price uh, uh, identification. And just think of you buy a house and, uh, and the house and you get a debt from a bank and uh, the house is getting is decreasing in value, uh, then your bank will ask you for some more securities. And right, this is happening here with the NFT. If the uh, value would change, uh, you, um, you would uh, get another rating on it. We have a rug pull resilient uh, because um, the protocol starts to own its own liquidity. So in the end, uh, the liquidity providers can move on to other markets, create new markets, and the, the existing markets would be uh, supported by the protocol-owned liquidity. So what is a perpetual NFT market and how does this work? So the only thing you need, as I said, is a, the NFT with its smart contract address and the ID. And uh, by that, you can, uh, we create a, a bull and a bear token. So we say the, the bull token is, a, is for indication the price is undervalued, the actual price. And the bear token tells me uh, the price is overvalued. So if I, if I say the 69 million people's NFT is uh, overvalued, I would buy some bear token on it. Concrete example, so you take the board AB8 Club. If you don't own it, you can trade on it. You just need the smart contract ID. Uh, address and the ID, 8520, and then, then you can create the market on uh, PySwap. The same thing with my avatar, for example. We say it's andreashofmann.e, so you have a smart contract address, I have the ID. You could trade on my NFT, on my avatar. Um, I guess you would say it's more worth than 10,000. <laughs> So how does this prediction market work in details in the end? Um, so I will walk through, we started the artist at number one. So the artist creates an NFT and puts it on a blockchain. And he wants to have uh, 10 E's for it, for example. And the, blue, uh, the green guy, he's buying the NFT. That's the first one here. And um, the artist gets the 10 E's from the wallet of the, uh, of the buyer, of course. So we have the number four, this is an interested user. He knows this, uh, the NFT is quite good and the artist is well known now and 
he thinks that it would be a good trade on, on this NFT and he would like to participate on it, but he didn't have the 10 E's in pocket, so he wasn't able to buy it. But he now can uh, create the market at PySwap, provide some liquidity. By providing liquidity, the bull and the bear tokens get created uh, automatically. And then other users are able to buy the bull token if they think the, uh, the price will rise, or they buy some bear tokens if the price will decrease. So you can do that for any NF NFT, as said, and um, the liquidity providers, the number five, they will um, go to the next market. If the market is quite major, um, they, they are not uh, needed anymore because the protocol has owned enough liquidity for the market and they can go move on to other markets where they earn more in the end. So the use of the protocol is not limited in the end, as I said. Um, we are focusing NFTs right now, but you're also able to, to predict governmental services, of course, for that. Yeah? Or you, you would be able to predict the prices for land, for houses, for digital assets, for fashion, or whatever you are buying and, and, and using in the, in the metaverses. Because, I mean, the, the people, they buy, pay two million for, for land in, in the metaverse right now, and nobody knows if this is worth. If I buy a house in Munich, I just uh, take uh, the, the newspapers and, and see what is it, the price. We call it Bodenrichtwert in Germany. Uh, so I think the PySwap protocol would be able to predict the prices for land all over the, the metaverses and uh, would f uh, function as a kind of a Bodenrichtwert. Yeah? So we have all the gaming assets that would be able to predict in, the, in their prices in the end. So uh, the people earn their assets, they game it and they earn it and so they, then they can sell it. They don't have to find a, a, a buyer for it, they can sell it to the protocol in the end. That's a feature that is... Um, Really interesting because with enough money, with enough liquidity in the protocol, the protocol uh, uh, enables the swap function and then you are able to sell your NFT to the protocol. So the protocol holds the NFT and you are not in the need to find for your NFT, for your asset that you have the, the buyer on that day. You just put it in there and uh, one day uh, another buyer comes along and uh, he thinks, hey, that's the asset I ever wanted, so he can buy it from the protocol. We could also predict the CO2 emissions uh, or elections or pollings. That's uh, all possible. It depends on how you, you uh, create the incentivization, of course, and, uh, and, and how the bull and bear tokens uh, um, are, um, uh, yeah, how they, how they uh, are used to predict these Elections. election was the first one, was the auger, for example, that was just a two-sided uh, yes or no uh, token. So we had some uh, possible project corporations in the OC2. Uh, we think that with uh, NFT Watch, there would be the possibility to create a kind of a rating uh, browser plugin. Um, because uh, NFT Watch, they gather data on, on, on metadata on the NFTs and uh, we would be able to, or they would be able to, to um, deliver the data uh, to, to a plugin. And if you search on an on a NFT and you have installed the plugin, for example, you just, it's, it pops up and tells you it's a five star rating of that, or this NFT is uh, fake or whatever. With the Bowler, uh, we have thought that um, the customized smart contracts would be nice for artists, for example, because you need to create a uh, customized contract for your own, with your own royalties, with, with your own uh, uh, options that you want to put in. So the, uh, cr uh, for the primary market, it would be very interesting to create uh, NFT smart, co smart contracts uh, based on, on the NFT NFTs. And uh, the Peronix Polygrop, uh, would, uh, they, they face some similar liquidity pool issues uh, as we do. So we have found some uh, possible connections to them, that, but they need a few more weeks, as, as I know. Yeah, if any questions are left, uh, Daniel and me, we are happy to answer them. And so far, say thanks for your attention. Oh, and we have 
two questions on Saya. So what is the current development stage of your solution? So the current development stage is we have a fixed uh, smart contract audit. Uh, we, are, we are almost um, ready to deploy. I think we will deploy, I would say in July. We'll be, we have some issues with uh, setting up the legal and the tax structures right now because we are at the border to financial uh, uh, markets, of course, and we have to make sure that the, uh, that the protocol or the whole um, setup is not uh, liable to, to any r uh, regulations in the end. Uh, in July, will you, will you have the, uh, the complete product or do you think you will add more features? Uh, no, we have, we have the, f the final version is uh, then live. We will start with the beta, with the closed beta in, in July and then we will open it um, okay. on mainnet. It's always running, or uh, it's running on, on uh, Rinkeby right now. We have a test version, you can play on it. And uh, we will, uh, then open it in July on the beta, then we will do the uh, one month, I guess, with, uh, with the beta, then we open it for another one, and uh, hopefully we will uh, go mainnet and, and launch full uh, as open platform in, yeah, I would say, in late August, September, something like oh, that. We have another very good question. How long does it take to perform an FT prediction, price prediction in PySwap? Well, <laughs> it's an order of minutes, <laughs> seconds, hours. In the end, it's, it's, it's of course, it's <laughs> to create the, the, the NFT market, uh, the, the bull bear market, it's only oh, seconds. It's not but what it's you not need is like you yeah. need the traction on it. Yeah. Yeah? It's, it's not only with creating it. So if you, if you create a market on a for an NFT that, is mm. that has no traction, it doesn't. So you will have no price prediction, but the fact that you cannot get a price prediction is an indicator that it's not worth much. If, if you don't use it, you won't get it, of course. Okay. So and we will it's start. Used, it's, mean hmm? that it's not interesting. Yeah, yeah. you need to, you need to um, of course, it, it's not easy for, for or it's not for, for any NFT that you create, for example, say, now uh, you need to find uh, followers in the end or you need to find uh, uh, engaged people, of course. Huh? So the, the, in the gaming metaverses, these would be the gamers. In the, uh, in the art market, that would be the, the art fans. Um, so what you need is, uh, you need traction on the, on the market, but if there is no traction, you just close it. Yeah, that makes sense. And the last question, how would you see any collaboration with OpenCore 3? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think the the protocol is able to um, to do uh, to be used in the in energy market in the end, for example, because uh, you could predict. Um, I mean, in the end, energy is the the most uh, needed resource in the end. Uh, we we need it for for oh, almost so anything. You would extract the uh, price prediction mechanism for, for example, things that are yeah. other than NFTs. Yeah. You can use it for real for real assets. You can use it for everything in the end. This, what we are addressing now is the NFT market, mm. but uh, you can use the protocol for any prediction market you have in mind. You just need to, to streamline the incentivization, incentivization structures or you need to, to customize some other things. But uh, it's a layer one protocol that can be used on, uh, for, for any asset. So it could become an um, on-chain service which would be uh, arbitrary price, me um, price prediction mechanism for arbitrary. Yep. Goods and services yep. with right. trust for and any uh, right. situation. Right. That is, do you have a question? <coughs> so, Andreas, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so, it's exactly uh, this uh, question that needs to be clarified. Maybe um, this collaboration with Open Call 3 was not clear in the beginning, but uh, I mean, correct me if I am wrong, but uh, don't you, uh, I mean, have. Uh, this uh, generic purpose uh, APIs that can be used by anyone uh, for uh, setting up a market for arbitrary items? Yep. Okay, in, in that sense, I mean, uh, any kind of application that needs a price determination mechanism can employ this API that you offer. Right. And of course, you couldn't show here in this presentation, but I mean, you make money out of this, right? We try to. I mean, you, you have a business model. We have, we have one, yeah. We, we, we're not sure if it works, but uh, we think that we have one, yeah? Okay, great, thanks.
All right. Uh, is there any mechanism employed uh, against uh, price manipulations? I mean, yep. if you don't have enough uh, participants, then there might be might be very sensitive that you uh, that there might be some hordes yep. putting some extremely high price. Yeah, we do have it. We have um, the uh, the the fee structure is uh, um, um, very variable. So. It depends on how much you put in. Um, the, the you, you pay more fees. If, you're, if your stake is bigger, it's dominating the market, you have to pay much more fees than you have to pay if you just put in a, a small uh, amount. So that's uh, decentralizing the, the, uh, the bad actors in the end. Uh, and and if, if I may, if I may uh, so far add some question, is so far this fee is higher than the potential uh, reward uh, by some fraudulent usage of manipulation of the price. <laughs> if I express it correctly, the, que the question is uh, how um, what would you how would you um, um, explain or what would you understand on, on the manipulation? I mean, if you open the market, you could say that you have to to de define your price uh, prediction. You say okay, the, uh, you could take the price that is offered, like for the Ape Yacht Club, you say 60 60 ETH for for this thing. Or you can uh, take your own. So that's, uh, of course, if, you, if you're uh, below this price, uh, the market will arbitrage quite, quite fast. Because we're working together with arbitrage companies that uh, have arbitrage bots that do the market uh, 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 equi equilibrium. So. And we have yeah, one last question at the. Okay. Maybe one last question at the back first, because you've been trying to uh, to ask a question for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for hi. Um, just uh, when you mentioned the business model, can you, in a few sentences, say what what are you guys doing? Like, do you have a token, or is there any mm. sort of fee structure? Mm. Curious. We, as explained, we, we have the the fee structure, so the liquidity providers get the fee for providing liquidity. We don't have anything with that to do. Uh, the protocol owns a uh, part portion of the uh, of that fee. Uh, by, by if if uh, bull and bear tokens get minted or burned, this is the process where the protocol owns money, not we. The protocol owns the money, and uh, what the protocol does is we we will deploy the pi swap token, and you are able to uh, to stake this uh, as a governance token, and then you will get a portion of the whole um, uh, fee. So it's for everybody in the end. If you if you own PySwap token, you can stake them, and you get uh, part of the uh, of the fees. So in, in the end, it will be a, a DAO or a foundation, something like this. Huh? And uh, yeah, it could be used for all prediction. Uh, very good, uh, of course. That's a perfect uh, example because um, for 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 any asset in the end, for any. Uh, um, um, for oil, for gold, for whatever you think. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. No, yeah. Uh, and this concludes, I think, um, this Antochain Summit. I think we have one last word from uh, Vlado Sankowski. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you for uh, having this great session before and for all the participants. Um, so <coughs> we are at the end of the second day. Uh, we are definitely going to have some more uh, webinars uh, to explain even more in depth uh, the uh, possibilities uh, offered for funding in the third open call of OntoChain. And we really uh, look forward to developing a um, community of people uh, who would like to uh, work in the long <coughs> term together with us on topics uh, which are in the cross-section between the semantic web and the blockchains. Because there is a lot of things, as we can see in all these projects, that are still uh, immature. Some things are more mature than others. Uh, we hope to really explore in the third open call the possibilities to be able to develop production grade applications that are actually showcasing uh, high quality of data used uh, within different um, business scenarios, between people, between companies 
and any other uh, constellation possible. So uh, with this, um, I'd like to uh, close this Onto Chain Summit. We will have one more, uh, definitely next year around the same time. And um, I, I would like to invite you all who are here today uh, to come outside and have some joint photo together so that we publish it on the uh, project uh, website. So thank you very much again and see you again um, per perhaps in these uh, new projects uh, or as any uh, affiliates to our software ecosystem. So see you later. Bye-bye.